The mean streets of Detroit have not been kind to these magnificent men and their racing machines. For the Valvoline Grand Prix of Detroit runs over a course that crushes cars, massacres motors, and deflates drivers' daring do. Ask Rick Mears about that. He's won the Indy 500 four times, but has never mastered the motor maze that are the streets of Detroit. This sport is overflowing with punch-cut drivers who can conquer any speedway with ease, but find a street corner in downtown Detroit a greater challenge. So, the challenge is here for Al Unser Jr., the national champion, for Michael Andretti, last year's winner here. For his father, Mario, the all-time legend. This race, these streets, are about to take their toll. For in Motown, for old pros and young challengers alike, the opposition is not the man in the car alongside, but the curbs and corners of the streets of Detroit. Today's Detroit weather is like its streets, mean, suffocating heat, and high humidity. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Economaki, waiting for the start of today's $1 million Valvoline Grand Prix of Detroit. Thousands of fans have lined these streets and have given so many drivers so much trouble over the years. But one man seems to have the key, last year's flag-to-flag -flag winner, Michael Andretti. This year, Andretti has outsped all of his IndyCar rivals to win the pole position for today's race. And he's standing by now with my CBS colleague, Mike Joy. Thank you, Chris, and happy Father's Day, everybody. Michael Andretti, father of two, is dressed in his Sunday best and ready to roll. Michael, what's been the trick to conquering these mean streets of Detroit? You've done it here so well. Uh, I really don't know. I think uh, probably a lot of it has to do with I like the circuit. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a fun circuit, and that's the only explanation I have. Will the humidity be tough on you today? It's about 85 degrees, but the humidity is the same. It's tough. You know, this track is probably the toughest on you uh, physically, and then to have the heat on top of it is going to make for a long day. Good luck today. Thanks a lot. One driver who's well known as the car series oval track specialist hasn't had much luck on these mean streets. He's with Chris Economaki. Here's Rick Mears. Congratulations on that fourth Indy, Rick. Thank Detroit's you. been a tough one for you, though, hasn't it? Well, it has been a little bit, but hopefully we can maybe try to turn that around today. I see they're taking the hood off your car. Is there a problem? No, no, just getting things ready to go. Okay, good luck to you. Rick Mears, ready to go. And now topside to Ken Squire. Stand by. 62 laps, 155 miles around the beautiful Detroit Renaissance Center. And hello, everyone. Ken Squire here on Father's Day. National Tie Day. Hope you're going to enjoy our Detroit Grand Prix coverage. Couple of stories to consider as we get ready to go. This is the most competitive season that Cart has had. Five different winners. Seven if you want to go back to 1990. Started with John Andretti and then the Andretti clan blitzed Milwaukee. Cleared the entire podium the last time out. And another story. The story of the chassis in this race. They're all foreign built with the exception of one. All built in England except car number 11, the True Sports entry, built in the memory of Jim Truman. It's taken over a year to create, and there you see Scott Pruitt. And if American Car wins this race, the only one in the field would be Scott Pruitt's first victory, and it would give us six different winners thus far in 1991. Let's join Mike Joy. Here for the most important words in motorsports, the mayor of the city of Detroit, the Honorable Coleman Young. Gentlemen, start your engines. As these cars roar to life, let's meet the 25 drivers who will start the Valvoline Detroit Grand Prix. Here's Ken Squire with the starting grid. In row one, 
the 1990 Detroit winner in the Paul Newman Carl Haas entry, Michael Andretti, and alongside the 89 Detroit winner and two-time world champion, Emerson Fittipaldi. For row two, it's the four-time Indy 500 champion, Rick Mears, and the 1990 Indy 500 winner from Holland, Ari Leyendijk. In row three, the 1978 world champion from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, Mario Andretti, and Scott Pruitt, second here two years ago. Row four is the current point leader, Bobby Rahal, and winner of the season opener in Australia, John Andretti. For row five, the third place finisher a year back from Aspen, Colorado, Eddie Cheever, and defending car PPG champion, Al Unser Jr. Row six, from Michigan comes Scott Brayton and the young Canadian, Scott Goodyear. Row seven is the 85 Indy 500 champion, Danny Sullivan in the Alfa Romeo, and Roberto Guerrero in Kenny Bernstein's car. Row eight, making his IndyCar debut here a year back, Mike Roth and Jeff Andretti, the leading rookie candidate. In row nine, a 14-year veteran, Tony Bettenhausen, and from Japan, Hiro Mashusta. In row 10, it's the 56-year-old legend from Houston, Texas, A.J. Foyt, and the freshman driver out of Vail, Colorado, Buddy Lazier. Row 11, in the Bill Cosby, Derek Walker car, Willie T. Ribs, and from South Florida, Dennis Vitolo. Row 12 is Italy's Guido Daco, and alongside Jeff Wood. Rounding out the field, from Los Angeles, Ted Prappas. My colleague in the booth for today will be David Hobbs, and he, with the assistance of Danny Sullivan, will give you a bird's eye view of what this track is all about. As he crosses the start-finish line, Danny reaches about 175 miles an hour, the fastest part of this Detroit course. On the way into turn one, hard on the brakes and down to fourth gear, tight line all the way around this 180 degree bumpy bend, bad adverse camera on exit. Right out to the guardrail there, up to fifth. Easy to try and get sucked into passing into turn three as he goes down to third, clips the guardrail on the inside, gets right close to the wall on the outside, stays in third up this bumpy old hill into turn four. Short shifts here to fourth and then fifth to these very fast left-hand sweeps. The road's bumpy, slippery, and very narrow here as he approaches turn seven, hard on the brakes, down to third. Accelerates through the park under the trees. Nice bit of shade there for these guys. Resurfaced here, but you wouldn't know it to see his head bobbing around as he brakes very hard for turn eight and down to third gear again. Stays in third, tries to keep the car to the left there, so he gets a good swing here onto Larned Street because this is one of the fastest parts of the course, must make the best exit there to try and pass people as he comes down to turn 10 and back to third gear again. Another left-right complex here. Again, tries to make the most of the second part of this because a little bit of overtaking might go on as they come down to Cobo Hall, the slowest corner here on the track, takes second gear, the only time here on this track. Very slow corner. Snatches third gear straight away, downhill. No passing through here, I can assure you. Very tight and twisty all the way under the bridge there. Comes down to the Atwater Tunnel corner. Stays in third gear here and accelerates into the dark. Very deceiving on a day like today when it's so bright outside. Up to fifth gear again, about 150 miles an hour. Hard on the brakes for the last two right and left turns. This last one here is vital because we're now coming back to the front straight, the fastest part and the best place to overtake on the streets of Detroit. Busy little racetrack. Extremely busy, very hard work on the drivers, very hot this afternoon. And if you add up the 62 laps that these guys are going to do this afternoon, those on the right are the statistics. This place is tough. It's going to be very hot as the afternoon wears on. And of course, any one of those 11,532 manholes could pitch you into the outside wall and really spoil the afternoon for you. A tough day coming up for these guys. <laughs> Great day for the dentist. A lot of fillings will be needed to replace after this one's over. We'll return with more live coverage of the Valvoline Detroit Grand Prix after this message and a word from your local station. We're back with you, all cars off the line, looking in good shape as we get ready, completing the second lap. There you see the temperature right now to 80, the humidity dropping to 50%. Skies are cloudy. There is a potential of showers before the afternoon is over. The field away in good order with Michael, with Michael Andretti on the pole, his 16th career IndyCar pole, and uh, the Andretti family on this Father's Day looks stout out here, David. 
They do. They certainly looked stout uh, just a couple of weeks ago back at Milwaukee, and I'm sure they're hoping for a repeat this afternoon. Mario has not had a great deal of luck at this track. Uh, John has led, uh, Michael has led 114 of the hun last 117 laps here, so um, I expect he's hoping to repeat this afternoon, and of course, cousin or nephew John is in there with him. Scrubbing in the tires, getting them a little warmed up to... Well, uh, exactly. They're trying to put some heat in the tires here by, the, by working the tire against the road surface. And, of course, it rubs off any uh, stuff that may have stuck to the outside of the tires there. We see little Al, the current national champion, going down Larned Street to this left-right complex, which you'll probably take right at the beginning of the race in second gear. We had third on our charts, which is probably what he'll try and use as the race goes on, but with the tanks full of fuel and a lot of traffic out there, he'll be in second. And, of course, he is stuck back in the field somewhat they had a terribly disappointing qualifying run yesterday afternoon he's languishing in 10th spot not where he wants to be at all on full tanks this morning emerson fittipaldi was the quick one and here is bobby rahal still seeking his first win of the year although he leads by two points in the ppg cart championship battle for 1991. bobby rahal always a good runner tremendously experienced unflappable down to the atwater tunnel just about ready to complete two and a half miles and complete the preliminary laps as Michael Waltrip brings the field down. After having one flag to flag here a year ago, coming to the pump house turn, Michael, the only driver to have led all six Indy, or rather five Indy car races this season, trying to make it six here today. Pace car pulls off. Start of trying to slow them down a bit, keep the field bunks together. And on the break, here we come, pulling for turn number one directly here in front of us. Michael Andretti jumps out in front, pulls away by two car lengths. They call that second part of the horseshoe turn two. Here we are diving down, ready to head on to St. Antoine Street, uphill here into third gear. Then they'll turn on to Woodbridge, tight running there. Two by two around those corners, and Ari Leyendijk in the uh, bright red car there, the number nine car, made a dynamite start. He's right with Michael as they go up through that very tricky turns five, six, and into seven. Very dodgy here, bumpy uh, approach to that corner. Woodbridge, then on to Chrysler quickly. Now headed down Congress Street, and they let them out for just a moment. Ready to make that quick turn onto Bobian, and then They'll get them up into high gear as they head down Larnard and climb to over 160 miles per hour. It's about the second fastest straight here. It's also extremely bumpy, especially as you saw there where the car got just a little bit over to the left of the road, which is where you want to be if you're going to overtake anybody, and it gets extremely bumpy out there. Down Woodward, now they're on to Jefferson Avenue, headed for Cobo Hall by the Pontchartrain Hotel. Coming around by the Joe Lewis Arena and over the railroad tracks right here. Very tough part of the course. Yeah, they actually cross the, the real railroad tracks there, don't they? Unlike Pescara back in the early 60s. There we see little Al, who is coming up. There's the uh, True Sports, the American guy, the number 11. That's got a Judd engine. They feel they give a little bit up on their engines, but uh, Michael Andretti with the Chevrolet. In fact, all those four front cars have got the Chevrolet power unit. Michael pulls onto the front straight for the first time, completing the first of 62 laps here in Detroit. Leyendijk making a good run in second place, and as they come by, Michael Andretti has led every race this season. Had an opportunity to be up in front. You're riding with Unser as they come down into this very critical, fastest part of the race course, breaking hard, coming down here around turns one and two with long, Al Unser Jr. Long corner, that. Rick Mears, the car in front of him, the number three Marlborough car of Roger Fenske, Seem to have just a little bit more than uh, Al Unser around that long corner, which I'm just a tad surprised at. That is one of the most important corners here because it goes on for such a long way if you can get the car working through there. And this section we're looking at now, uh, it's going to make your afternoon much easier. Leyendijk, who has been getting stronger of recent, here he is, had a great run again in Indianapolis this year where he won in 1990. Stays right there. Well, part of Leyendijk's key is that he's got Mo Nunn as his engineer. And I remember Mo Nunn driving Formula 3 cars back 25 years ago in England with me. And he has become one of the super engineers. And he was Emerson Fittipaldi's engineer last year when he won the champion, uh, the year before last, when he won the championship. And he's working the magic now on Ari Leyendijk's car. Okay, take a look here. This in-car camera shows two things. How stiff the suspension on the car is. Watch the driver's head. Now, they've repaired this circuit overnight. Or 
stock cars raced here yesterday and dug a lot of holes in it. They patched it yesterday evening. It was a tremendous rainstorm. It washed out some of the patches. They repatched it this morning. The stock car driver said it was the worst track they've ever raced on. It's very, very bumpy, and these cars have really cast iron suspensions. This is one of the toughest tracks on drivers, as you can see. It will really shake you loose as you complete just even half the distance. And Willie T. Ribs was telling us, Chris, that you have to train for the second half and really train for this course because it's it's so demanding. It will beat you up more than Indianapolis. Running third is Emerson Fittipaldi. Fourth is Scott Pruitt. Fifth is Andretti. Mears is running in sixth. Al Unser is in seventh. Cheever is in eighth. And you're riding with Bobby Rahal right now in ninth position. Rahal, the current point leader in the CART PPG series. There you see Bobby Ray Hall, and you'll see what Chris was talking about as you come into the corner here, that, that white streak down the middle. Yesterday afternoon, the Trans Am boys really dug the surface up here, and they had to lay that quick-drying cement. There's more of it there overnight. Uh, the trouble with that quick-drying cement is I've raced at many places with it. It's very, very slippery, and of course, they've had no chance to put any rubber down on it. Uh, this is the first time they've seen it. It was this morning, and times in the morning's warm-up were way off uh, yesterday afternoon's practice and qualifying. Speaking of slipperiness, one-third of the course has been resurfaced. And whenever you lay new tarmac down, it has a quality of being a bit oily. And then we had a dramatic rain shower last night that blew away about a third of the tenting here as that cold front moved through. And uh, between about, all of that and the... <laughs> did, did about a million dollars worth of damage to tents last night in the paddock, didn't it? Most of the tents can be found somewhere in southern or northern Ontario today. <laughs> There you see more of that patching there. Actually, Chris had a point, you know, the suspension on these cars, it's so stiff. Uh, and of course, the reason for that is that these cars rely so much on the air going not only over the car, but under it to pull it down onto the road. So you need to keep the gap between the road and the car as even as possible all the time. And the only way to do that is to control the suspension movement. It's tough on the driver. Uh, but it certainly makes the cars a lot quicker. Area of the course where there used to be a chicane for Formula One. It's wide open here for the CART PPG cars. And you see Leyendijk in the number nine staying right there, just two, three car lengths behind Michael Andretti. Leyendijk, who is a fine road racer, but hasn't led on a road course since back in June of 88, three years ago at Portland. Chris? Sorry. Yes, Ken made the point that 30% of the track was resurfaced, but what he didn't say was it was done by the low bidder. And that's why it's <laughs> as rough as it is. But seriously, for a moment, Leyendijk is staying so close to Andretti here, this is going to be a two-pit stop race. If he can hold that interval, this race could be won or lost in the pit stop. The first window for pits is in the late 20s. Before 30 laps come up, the first scheduled pit stop will take place, unless there's a yellow flag before that. Fuel consumption in this race is of vital importance. They must average about 1.72 miles uh, per gallon here to get by with only those two stops or running out. You see the third place car, Emerson Fittipaldi, lying about 15 car lengths back. As Leyendijk is making a very good run in the early going against Michael Andretti, who had the entire field covered by a second. He was one second quicker than anyone in qualifying. The third year in a row that he's been on the pole. This track just sort of fits his style. It certainly seems to. He, is, uh, he was quoted yesterday afternoon in an interview as being aggressive like his father. He feels he's a very aggressive driver. And this is the sort of track where you need to be aggressive with the track, not just with the other drivers. This is the sort of track where you've got to take it by the scruff of the neck. In fact, the first time Michael ever drove on this track was as teammate to your teammate, DWH, <laughs> when I drove the Chevrolet Corvette here in the Trans Am. He came along and guested in the other car team manager at the time was John Dick, who's the team manager now, or the chief engineer on Little Al's car, and he said he'd never seen such big flat spots on tires in his whole life. <laughs> there he's you learned see. a lot since then. There you see the fourth place car, Andretti, coming by, followed by Pruitt, then Mears in the three, Al Unser, Eddie Cheever rolling along here. Remainder of the field coming down one of the fastest portions of the course alongside the Detroit River. You see Roberto Guerrero's car storming by, and uh, right behind him comes Jeff Andretti. Back in front, and it's a two-car war in the streets of Detroit between Michael Andretti seeking his second straight win on this course, and Ari Leyendijk, great Dutch driver, who's really giving it a run here in the early going. Coming about, we've completed four laps. That means that there are 58 remaining in the 155-mile distance to be covered on this two-and-a-half-mile course. Stay with us here for our live coverage 
on CBS of the Valvoline Detroit Grand Prix. After five of 62 laps, Michael Andretti leads with Ari Leyendijk in second, Fittipaldi is third, Mario Andretti is fourth, and Scott Pruitt has fallen back one position into the fourth position. Further back in the field out here, A.J. Foyt, who had started in 19th, has picked up one position. He's now up to 18. In racing, legends can come and go quickly, but one who has stayed the course for 35 years is A.J. A record 67 victories, a lifetime in this sport. But last fall's crash that shattered both his feet had him in a talkative mood with Chris Economaki earlier this morning. This is a physically demanding course, Jay. Is it extraordinarily tough on you? Well, my feet aren't really coordinated like they should be. Of course, uh, I'm trying to do something I'm not supposed to do. The doctors didn't care for me to run this early on the road course, but I'm just going to try to ride it out because I figure the sooner the better to get my feet oriented again. And it, it's going to be kind of hard, but we're just going to ride it out and try to. For you, is Detroit tougher than Indy? Oh, I would say uh, yes. For driving, yeah, by far it's a lot tougher on me because, like I say, my feet aren't coordinated. Indy, you run pretty much flat out and you can look ahead, but right here you got so much braking and shifting to do, and, and it's very hard on for my particular situation, yes. Fans the world over are wondering, AJ, is this your last year? Oh, definitely it's my last year on the circuit, yes. Notice that he said last year on the circuit. He's still going for that one more once. At least that's in the back of his mind for Indianapolis. Here he is closing on Bettenhausen, the number 16 car that's running in 17th position. Tony running just in front of A.J. Foyt. And just behind them is Willie T. Ribs in the number 10 car, 19th position, the yellow machine. Willie T. going well this afternoon, actually. Meanwhile, up in front, it's still all Michael Andretti bidding for his second consecutive flag-to-flag -flag win here at Detroit. You know the last guy to pull that off, David? A.J. Foyt, back in 74 and 75 when they had those 100-mile qualifiers, which were counting races out at the old Ontario Motor Speedway on that two-and-a-half mile. So it's been a while since somebody's backed them up like that. But he's not having it all his own way. Harry Lyon Dyke and Emerson Fittipaldi right behind him. This time last year, Michael had assumed a tremendous lead in this race, but he's right being hounded at the moment by the other two. Here we see Rick Mears in the number three car, followed closely by Bobby Ray Hall in the Craco car. And right behind him is John Andretti. So all the Andrettis are right up there. John Andretti in the 10th position. Just in front of him, by night, here's Bobby Ray Hall. Coming out onto Congress, under the trees. Trying to close in on Rick Mears in the three car just in front of him. Bobby, in fact, these two, of course, are your current points leaders. Bobby Ray Hall has two more than Rick Mears, the man in front of him. Uh, as you said earlier, Bobby Ray Hall has yet to win a race this year, but is still leading the championship. But not necessarily, oh, we got trouble. That's a true sports car. That's Scott, Scott Pruitt. Pruitt. Scott Pruitt around. And I think he's taken that right his right rear wheel looks a bit deranged and there's another car there somewhere I think fifth and sixth place cars involved Al Unser Jr. was in that I think Al, Al was trying up. to get around him wasn't he Al moves up to fifth Scott Pruitt was in sixth and now is falling back the true sports car the only American chassis in the field and he was really hoping for a good day after he had been fourth fastest on full tanks in the 30 minute practice training period this morning Looks like he's trying to get it fired and get back into this thing. And we've seen them come from behind before. Remember Fittipaldi in 89? He and Mario had that little altercation right here in turn number one, went to the rear of the field and fought his way to victory. Well, he fought his way back twice because he then ran into Mario again down at the Cobo Hall, right. and they both came to a complete grinding halt, and he still went on to win the race. Bit of a cliffhanger, that. I don't expect any of them want to do that this afternoon, but these front three, Michael Andretti in the number two car, Harry Leyendijk, Emerson Fittipaldi waiting there. Two-time world champion in Formula One. Indy 500 winner. No mean accomplishment. Tremendously motivated still at the age of uh, 43. Real international flavor in the front three position here in the streets of Detroit, live on CBS with the United States first, Holland's Lion Dyke second, Brazil's Fittipaldi third, and the Andretti's have sandwiched Lion Dyke and Fittipaldi between them as Michael runs up on top, Mario back and forth. Al Unser picking up a spot to six. Eddie Cheever has come to fifth. And there down at turn nine, we see a giant Union Jack against
against the fence. Now then, this is where it's really bumpy down the inside. Ray Hall has a go down the inside of Rick Mears, thinks twice about it. Meanwhile, that has allowed John Andretti in the second in that very, ooh, and that is the Pig Enterprises car, Ted Prappas, I believe. From Los Angeles. Uh, looks like a fire could be starting. Is indeed. He was, in fact, running dead last. Uh, something may have gone wrong. Yep, flames are coming out of it. And that's at a spot on the racetrack where it's going to take a moment or two to get someone to it. That's right, I believe, at the beginning of the pit straight here, because that's the river just behind it. I don't believe he realizes that he's... And there is a full-course caution coming out. Paul Newman, whose car runs up in front looking on here today, as the Michael and Mario team for Newman Haas, a first and fourth full-course caution is being put out for the first time today. It comes at lap number nine. And that's the first full course caution since 1989 here in the Detroit Grand Prix. First pit stop taking place right here for Rick Mears in number three. Taking this opportunity under caution to fill him back up again. Ray Hall pulls out. Roberto Guerra does not stop. 40 gallons of methanol strapped to your back in a car that's about 32 inches off the ground. For 155 miles of motorsport here in Detroit. This will give uh, little Al a bit of a, <coughs> a break. He obviously got caught up in that schmuzzle with Scott Pruitt down at turn 11. And... Um, he was lagging a little bit behind, but the car is obviously performing well. He had pulled himself up from 10th to 6th. So this could be just a little bit of a, a help to him. Here's Mike Joy. The True Sports team are servicing the All-American car of Scott Pruitt. Dennis Swan and Steve Dixon are changing the right tires while Bruce Matthews and John Howlett do the lefts. Mark Chrysadel, the fueler, he is done. Jim Steffen will drop the jack. No apparent damage to Pruitt's car, and he's away. And still being shown in the lead lap. Working I was going to say, lap. he was very, very lucky that the caution flag came out while he was trapped around the back of the circuit and did not lose a lap. The Prappas car, Ted Prappas, that has brought out this caution, had a very good run at Long Beach. Remember, he had a sixth place out there. From Al Unser's car, let's see what happened here with Scott Pruitt. Al trying to go down the inside. Now, this is that very bumpy bit of track. Scott takes his line. It's really his corner. I mean, he is in front. Wheels touch. Doesn't seem to have deranged uh, that right front wheel, which uh, gave the True Sports car quite a belt, and the, and the True Sports car looks okay too. So both pretty lucky there. Scott Pruitt on the comeback trail. With One of the problems with this type of racetrack, of course, is that you have to, just have to try and force your way by. As you can see from the way the track is laid out, there's not all that many places to pass and uh, Al tried to run there and it just didn't quite come off. Well here you see them winding their way around Cobo Hall by Cobo Hall and then down to the Atwater Tunnel and we'll be back with more in a moment. With 10 laps complete 52 remaining Michael Andretti has the lead he did not pit. Ari Leyendijk is staying second he too did not elect to come in for fuel. Maintaining third spot, Mario Andretti, who did. Eddie Cheever, Rick Mears running in the fifth position. Those are the top five out here at the present time in the Detroit Grand Prix 10th Annual Get-Together on the banks of the Detroit River. Let's go to Chris Economaki. That yellow flag that Ted Prappas brought out was okay for Emerson Fittipaldi and Al Unser. They stopped because their cars needed adjusting. But that, what that does is commit them to a three-stop race. Michael Andretti, Rick Mears, and Ari Leyendijk are out there. They're only going to have to stop twice. They'll, their stops will come later. So this could have been a strategic plus or perhaps a strategic minus for those who, two drivers who stop. How do you feel about that? Well, of course, if they did have little problems with their cars and they were able to adjust those problems out, of course, it could be a tremendous strategic plus. Let's go to Mike Joy. 
Well, I may take issue with Chris's comment on strategy. Emerson Fittipaldi right now has dropped his boost pressure, dialed it down. He is using the highest possible gear that the engine won't lug on these caution laps and doing everything possible to conserve fuel. He also took on tires because of a slight altercation down in turn number one. The other Penske car, Rick Mears, came in and took on fuel only, but they're still thinking of this as a two-pit stop race. Time will tell. Emerson uh, hoping to make this a big day. He wanted here in 89, but it'd be a bigger day on this Father's Day. Wife home, Teresa waiting to be a mother today. He waiting to be a father at any moment. So that's the way to do it, to win the race and have the child on the same day. That's right, especially as it's Father's Day. Here you see the field grouping up, and we're at least a lap away from turning them loose another time. Prappas car that finished six at Long Beach was the reason that we came under caution. Here you see Mario's car. There's Rick Mears coming by, then Ray Hall, then Roberto Guerrero's machine. Right behind him, Jeff Andretti, then Danny Sullivan. There's A.J. Foyt's car, and A.J. has popped up in the standing some. A.J.'s going to find Guido it Daco. very, very difficult this afternoon. Guido Daco from Your Italy. buddy. My buddy from Italy. And the number 10 car, Willie T. Ribs, in this hunt. His second race of the year. New sponsor for today. In fact, the uh, CBS affiliate here in Detroit gave him some support to get out and run this event. Yep, I think um, I'd like to see his buddy uh, Bill Cosby uh, give him a decent slug of money, you know, about five or six million, which probably amounts to 25 minutes or more earnings for <laughs> Bill. And uh, that would really get Willie up to a good start. He deserves to do well, and he's got a good team now with Walker. If they could just get some serious finance, I'm sure they could, they could run well. He surprised everyone in the training period this morning, that final practice round. He was 11th quickest overall on uh, full tanks. Chris? Well, we're here with uh, Ted Prappas, the first man out of the race. A tough break, Brett. What happened to your car quickly? Uh, we just ran out of brakes. I mean, it's tough on brakes, but we lost ours fairly early. What, what is it like out there with this heavy humidity and all the patchwork on the course? It's it's tough. This place has always been bumpy, and they've they've fixed it up a little bit, but, you know, it, it's still a pretty bumpy street circuit. You know, we got Paul Newman, a car owner here, a multimillionaire. Your car owner is a Long Beach policeman. He got about 300 grand tied up in the car, hasn't he? Yeah, we just barely, I mean, we had a bunch of people come to us after Indy, and we were able to get the new car, and I, I'm really ashamed, and I'm sorry it had to end this way here because we were looking forward to the new car, but we didn't get to run it till Friday afternoon, and it's just, I guess, not the kind of place you want to test a car and more, more or less race it, so. Well, you're to be admired for your plug on the St. Order Road. Good luck next time to Ted Prappas. He's out of the race. Ted Prappas, who uh, got his start as a teamster out in the movie world, driving movie stars around where he came from originally and then did a little racing on the side made enough money and spent every penny he could get on trying to upgrade his uh, competitive abilities and finds himself now in Indianapolis car racing as we mentioned had a tremendous finish at Long Beach with sixth place yeah he's a, he's been a good driver Ted and it is very unfortunate he should be out of this race so early on uh, but he epitomizes the struggle that these drivers these young drivers have uh, Willie T, the guy we were talking about earlier on, just tremendous uh, problems to keep yourself racing these days financially. Two and a half mile track, and it's a struggle over every foot of it. Racing on the streets of Detroit means racing over many bumps and many manhole covers. In fact, 186 manhole covers on this course. Mike Joy took a closer look at the streets of Detroit. The mean streets of IndyCar racing are the streets of Detroit, with the same perils and pitfalls you'd face. Patches and pavement changes, manhole covers and storm drains. These covers at 75 pounds apiece would flip up in the air like tiddlywinks due to the ground effects of the IndyCars if they weren't welded down. The problem for the drivers is, especially in the corners, you go from pavement with good traction to the manhole cover, which you skip across like ice, and back to pavement and traction again. So for the driver, it's a constant battle and sawing and yanking the wheel out of his hands. It means this race is tougher on the drivers than it is on the race cars. Anytime you're hitting a manhole cover or any kind of a bump or anything like that, it upsets the balance of the car. And one of the keys around here is getting your car to go over the bumps and the manhole covers uh, and be able to keep the, the wheels, you know, tires on the, on the ground for as much traction. Uh, in terms of us, I don't care if the car's still handling the same I don't care how rough it is, just as so long as it's going over that with traction. 
Six of those manhole covers had to be welded down again this morning, David. They're still coming up, and there's such a vacuum off these cars. It, it, we saw what happened in Montreal in the Group C race where they actually pulled one up and destroyed a car. Destroyed two cars. It was a tremendous uh, incident because those manhole covers weigh about 60 or 70 pounds, so you can imagine what damage they do to these relatively fragile cars. The other thing that flips them up, of course, is these race tires get incredibly sticky as they get hot and they roll over and they sort of pick it up like a lint pick, you know, when you put it on your suit. Well, look here. You see those two manhole covers? They're driving between them now, but that puts them into you know, that area they have put that temporary cement in, which isn't much fun. You're bound to get off that line sooner or later. And what you didn't see in that picture was just in front of that, there was another manhole cover that you couldn't evade. No, there's more of that cement. Um, it'll gradually pick up rubber as the afternoon wears on. Uh, not too much in the pace car, we hope. And, of course, it'll, it'll pick up grip as the afternoon wears on. But just right now, uh, this is only the first few laps they've run on that cement only put down last night. Let's take a look at how the Andretti family is doing here. Remember, first, second, and third scored by the Andrettis at Milwaukee the last time out. And here's how they're scoring at the present time here in our live coverage from Detroit. Michael staying first. He dominates this racetrack. Mario's a good stout third. Jeff is in eighth, and John, who won in Australia, is back there in 12th spot. John must have stopped in that uh, round of pit stops because he was <coughs> running quite well up before. Mario says it's nice to have the kids in the family trade. Yeah. <laughs> he said, actually, he said yesterday, didn't he, that uh, he was willing to accept a Father's Day gift from the family today. And they said they thought they'd given him much too much already. And they said, yes, Dad, no trouble at all. And then, the other thing he says, we then asked if he was, how he felt racing in, in close proximity with any members of the family. He says, well, I think, I think we all know what we're doing. I think. <laughs> Didn't like the I think the second one. Though. Now, John Andretti has pitted in lap 10 to uh, drop down in the running order. The number four car, that's that number four right there, the Hall VDS car, has pitted, and so it falls further back. That was a pretty good scoring sheet on the Andrettis again. I'm sure are having fun. Uh, the two brothers and their cousins sat together, and their dad sat just in front of them at the driver's meeting this morning. Had a lot of fun with Mario. Let's go to Mike Joy. Of no apparent problem on the Scott Pruitt car. Uh, team manager Steve Horn said they got into a punch-up. Alan Sir Jr. got into him and damaged one of those $2,400 magnesium wheels, but Scott is okay. Lion Dyke diving to the inside at turn one. We have a new leader. Lion Dyke, the Dutchman, goes in first. Andretti drops to second. A great pass there, and Mario, Michael trying it down the outside, inside. Lion Dyke did a great job there. Michael thought about cutting him off, but decided not to. Up St. Antoine, headed on to Woodbridge. New leader, Lion Dyke in first place. Mario Andretti, line third on the restart. Eddie Cheever is in fourth. Rick Mears in fifth. Here comes Michael thrashing that car as he tries to collect Ari Lion Dyke back on Congress Street. Lion Dyke seems to be pulling away. Michael went very wide as they came out onto Congress there. Yes, Michael's car is definitely hasn't seen to got the grip that Lion Dyke's car has got at the moment. Remember that Lion Dyke qualified fourth in this race and that Michael Andretti was a second quicker than anyone, a second faster than even Emerson Fittipaldi who sat alongside him in the front row. Now we've got the Andretti clan, Michael second, Dad third. Dyke putting just a bit of daylight between himself and Michael. Down Jefferson, now in front of Cobo Hall, now in front of the Joe Lewis Arena. Here they come, diving back for the tunnel another time. And Michael Andretti has been stung by the 1990 Indianapolis 500-mile champion Ari Leyendijk, now in the lead. And of course, Ari Leyendijk had a great race earlier on this year at Phoenix, and just flat one everybody in the field made good pit stops and won the race very convincingly didn't run so well at indy uh, or did run very well at indy came from way back but look at the distance he's put between himself and michael and i suspect that mario is holding up the rest of the field mario is under serious uh, challenge jeff woods number 12 has found the concrete whoa 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 whoa, whoa. mario sliding down into turn one there everything locked up Mario going way wide, and you see everybody back to Guerrero diving beneath him there. Guerrero up to, from seventh up into six. Mears collecting, and Mario Andretti falling back dramatically. Mario's brakes, I'm sorry about that, folks, but Mario was 
within about six inches of our nose here on the racetrack slid past smoke pouring off all four tires which allowed all these people to go by on the inside of turn one this little group here being led by eddie cheever cheever now third rick mears fourth ray hall fifth guerrero six eddie cheever and there's there's mario oh the tires had it that's why he locked up his tire was obviously flat uh, which dropped down the left rear corner, lifted up the right front, and the right front's the one that was right under our window here, which is uh, probably actually only that one that was really smoking so badly. Now that's a tough break, because it happened right in front of the pits, of course, which means you've got to do a full lap like that before you can get it fixed. A, it takes a long time, and B, it's not very good for the car. There's his pit waiting, and for Mario Andretti, whose last win was in Cleveland back in 1988, don't look too optimistic here today. Still moving them around to Jeff Wood, car number 12, here at the Detroit Grand Prix. That's a corner caution, but not a full course caution at this moment for Jeff Wood's car number 12, making his second start of 1991 in a Lola Buick, one of two Buicks in the race, the other belonging to Roberto Guerrero. Not sure about those safety trucks on the uh, track. I'm just not sure how safe that really is. Make you nervous, don't they? I think it would make certain Frenchmen in Paris extremely nervous <laughs> if it was suggested it might be done in Formula One. <laughs> Battle for first. Leyendijk there looking for his second win of the season. Remember that Leyendijk just put on an amazing performance earlier on this year. First driver to pass Michael here at Detroit found himself victorious at Phoenix on the Oval. The guy has really settled into IndyCar racing in a big way. At Long Beach, he had himself a very good run going and had to settle back on that one when Al Unser came home victorious. Of course, he's uh, only fourth in the points. He's not all that far out. He's got 49 points, and Ray Hall is leading. He's got 60. So that's only 11 points out of the lead. So if he was to win here today, obviously, God forbid that we start talking about the winner. Here comes Mario into the pits. Just look at the time that that's cost him. Here's Mike Joy. Well, the left rear tire is completely shredded on the car and a little bit of fiberglass damage to the uh, aerodynamic fairing there just in front of the left rear wheel. But the car is up on the air jacks. John Simmons working the front of Jim Bellini, that left rear. Good quick stop getting Mario back out. Hopefully no further damage. By our watch, it was 13 and 2. 13.26 seconds on Mario Andretti's stop. That little bit of aerodynamic damage, of course, could have a, a big effect on this car. Talking to the engineers here over the weekend, if you lift these cars as little as a quarter of an inch off the ground, it can make as much as 700 pounds of downforce difference at close to 200 miles an hour. So you don't want anything to go wrong with your aerodynamics. Harry Leyendijk leads comfortably into turn one. And David, Mario did not lose a lap. He did not go down a lap on that occasion, even though he was limping on only three good legs around the course. Two so and he, half miles. That was extremely, uh, he, he kept the pressure on. Chris? Yes, I was noticing that start there. I think really it was Michael Andretti fell asleep at a Larry Land I got by. I don't think he's really beaten. He was caught napping at the start. One of the drivers that's impressing me is in the top six is Roberto Guerrero, who's back from half for a crash. And he's driving a Buick, six-cylinder Buick, a push rod production-based engine that is written off in this kind of racing because it doesn't have nearly the horsepower the other specials in the race have. He's doing a remarkable job for Kenny Bernstein, the car owner, and all the people from Buick in the stands here today. And he just took that car over this uh, past weekend. He got the call on Sunday night, went over to Mid-Ohio and did a couple of days of training with the car. And that's uh, the first time he had seen the Kenny Bernstein machine. He's really driven it well, but he does well here on this course. Roberto Guerrero. Watching from Bobby Rahal's vantage. Fifth place car as he attacks Rick Mears. Again, down Jefferson. Right behind them in the other Marlboro car, Penske car, of course, is Emerson Fittipaldi. Trying to make up some time. He was one of the guys that stopped under that last caution. Made a few changes to his cars. We don't know what. Um, hoping to pick up a bit of time. Now these three in lockstep as they go into the Atwater Tunnel. That must really bother to drive into a tunnel like that. You've had experiences like that. It's, it's not good. Uh, when the race started, it wasn't quite as sunny as it is now. And uh, 
it wouldn't have been quite so bad. As the sun comes out, yes, it becomes quite uh, disconcerting going from bright sunlight into the pitch black. Luckily, it's not a very long tunnel. Going past here, I saw Michael Andretti's left front wing sticking up in the air. So I think that might have just got clipped by our Ari when he went down the inside at turn one. Words, no doubt, will pass between them later on about that. There were words yesterday when Eddie Cheever and Didier Taze crashed here in turn number one. Tay's car had to be withdrawn from competition. All the drivers were cautioned today to be respectful of each other out here on the main streets of Detroit. Here you see those Penske cars wrapped around the Bobby Ray Hall, number 18, and one of our onboard cameras headed down Larned. Ray Hall, who's been consistent all year, has yet to score that victory, but stays right up on top in the standings. As smooth as always. Let's take a look a moment ago. Just coming out of the tunnel down by the pump house turn. Here's Lion Dyke and here's Andretti challenging. Oh, Ooh. that's what happened to that wing. <laughs> Again, Michael did what Al Jr. did. Uh, it clearly was Harry's corner. He was there first, but of course it's... Uh, Easy to say that sitting in here, isn't it? But that will have really spoiled Michael Andretti's afternoon. Expect him now to drop back into the clutches of the pursuing group. Eddie Cheever right behind him now and gathering up a challenge for second place as Lion Dyke stays first at Detroit. After 18 laps, 44 remaining, 110 miles to go, Lion Dyke is your leader. Michael Landretti with a damaged wing is in second. Eddie Cheever finds himself third. Looking further back in the field, Fittipaldi is in sixth, waging a war to move up. Unser's in seventh. John Andretti in eighth. Roberto Guerrero has just slipped back three spots to ninth. And Scott Brayton finds himself in the top ten, the Coldwater Michigan campaigner for the first time today. Here's Lion Dyke out in front and building a pretty healthy advantage, David Hobbs. Yeah, he has. Of course, uh, Michael will be really hurting with that wing deranged like it is. Here we see the group that's battling it out for fourth spot. Rick Mears in the three, Ray Hall in the 18th fifth, and Emerson Fittipaldi six. Here's more from Mike. This $10,000 worth of carbon fiber and decals is the spare nose for Michael Andretti's car. It attaches with about a dozen countersunk screws, mounts on pretty easily and quickly. You notice the wing planes are very flat. They depend very little for downforce from this nose piece, so the team does not expect it will significantly slow Michael. They'll wait until their regularly scheduled pit stop, and when he comes in, assess the damage and see if they need to fit the new nose or just let him go on the way it is. They sure could use another caution right about now for the Newman Haas team and the efforts of Michael Landretti. Here we see Michael coming up and Eddie Cheever's going to get him any minute now, I imagine. Michael's uh, car will be definitely wounded at this stage. Cheever takes a good line there, wider line, which means he should come off here quicker as long as he doesn't try and get him going into three. Working the 21st lap. Chris? Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I was asleep here. Like Michael, this, this long yellow flag that we saw has changed the character of the race to the point where the first pit stop is gonna be later, 30 to 32 laps, which means Michael Andretti has gotta live out there that much longer with that damaged wing. Now, we should really watch when he makes that stop with a stopwatch in our hand, because the nose piece is gonna have to be changed. We checked around here and they said that it's gonna take about 10 seconds to change the nose while the other work is going on. It may be that the work can be done on his car and a new nose put on without slowing his pit stop at all, but it won't happen until after the 30 lap mark goes by. And, and remember, Chris, that it was in 89 at Long Beach that Unser won without that left front wing, torn off in a similar incident. Now, Eddie Cheever will be very anxious to get around uh, young Michael Andretti here because closing in behind him is Rick Mears, Bobby Rahal, and Emerson Fittipaldi. I suspect that Rick Mears is actually holding uh, Rahal and Fittipaldi up just slightly, and so Eddie Cheever will be wishing to get around this young gent and getting on his way after Harry Lyondike before the others catch him up and they get embroiled in a five-car battle for what will effectively be second spot. 
I must admit that uh, Michael Andretti is handling this car around here exceedingly well, considering he basically has no left front wing at all, and it, it does make a tremendous difference. And there you see Mears in fourth, Ray yep. Hall fifth, to the Paul Lee sixth trio, and again, Cheever. This is right where they had the incident yesterday that eliminated the Didier Tay's car and also sent Cheever looking for the backup machine. Well, they're hanging in there extremely well with what must be uh, reduced uh, front downforce by 50%. You know, you, you drive the car in practice and qualifying, you turn the wing up half a degree and the driver comes in and says, why, that's terrific, or you lower it a quarter of a degree. And he says, oh, that's, that's absolutely stinks. And here's the thing <laughs> ripped right off and it doesn't seem to make any difference at all. Michael really has an affinity for this track. He led 52 of 55 laps here in 89 and last year was led flag to flag all 62. So that's 114 of 117. And back in 89, he would have gone the distance, except for the piece of cable that is an, that hitched to that radio antenna on the nose got wrapped around the throttle. And that was the end of his day. Plus, he got it stuck in, what, second gear and finally found a wall later. Well, he got his run. foot sort of stuck on the, around the cable. Cheever right up behind there. Bit deceptive there. That's why people do close up very much on braking. Down under here. Downforce, not such a major factor. This lower speed, quite low speed. But uh, he hangs on well for that turn one. Right. Coming up next, the NCAA Championship Series continues with the men's and women's outdoor track and field championship from the University of Oregon in Eugene. See if the LSU women can win the title for the fifth consecutive year. That's coming up next here on CBS Sports. We're with you live at Detroit, 10th Annual Valvoline Detroit Grand Prix, and watching Eddie Cheever countering Michael Waltrip in second spot at turn one. Michael Andretti. Did I say Michael Walter? Yeah. I'm already into next week. I you beg your pardon. I did it before, too, didn't I? <laughs> I beg your humble pardon. Next week will be in Michigan at MIS. 400 miles of competition. The Winston Cup Series continuing there. And Daryl and Michael will all be on hand. And we hope you'll join us. That's coming up next Sunday here on CBS. Eddie Cheever there, driving the number eight, the Target-sponsored car owned by Chip Ganassi, is under a little bit of pressure because he, uh, kind of the hotshot Formula One driver, come into uh, the kart series, and this is the sort of circuit where he should really shine. I mean, he has raced on this track ever since 1982 from the first Formula One race on, so he has far more miles on this track than anybody else, and uh, he needs to put up a good show, I think, really. Cheever second here in... Uh that first Formula One race from John Watson won. These aerial photos of the Detroit Grand Prix are brought to you courtesy of the CRM Group today. You see some of the course over which they're running. And they're in the streets of Detroit. And there's Eddie Cheever around the old pump house turn. Mike? Can't remember last year when Eddie Cheever finished third here and had such a blister he'd abraded two layers of skin off the palm of his right hand. He started this morning's race with already one layer gone off his thumb. They have it taped up. But the bouncing around here and the work you do with the gear shift and the steering wheel has to have him in a great deal of discomfort at this stage of the race, if not some outright pain. So I think it's a marvel that he's able to hold that position and run as well as he is, uh, given that injury to his hand, and it can only get worse. Up, Roberto Guerrero's car in trouble. The second Buick that had been running in 10th position finds itself in difficulty. Now, where's that? That must be at, uh, oh, Cobo Hall, I guess. The slowest corner on the track here. Uh, appears to be stuck. The crew, obviously, somewhat unwilling to uh, walk out in the traffic there with the car, understandably. Trying to get him to put some lock on the wheel there. Roberto Guerrero, of course, surviving that horrendous testing accident in Indianapolis a few years ago and was, in fact, unconscious for, what, 17 days and, uh, and came back to racing. There he goes on his way. And very excited about the prospects for this car. Roberto Guerrero back underway another time after trouble just at the end of Jefferson Avenue, right in front of Cobo Hall. We'll be back with more from Detroit after a message from your local station. A.J. Foyt, who's been in 17th spot, now on pit road, 
having completed 25 of the 62 laps and as tender as his feet are he can't wear leather sole shoes spends most of his time on his scooter or lying down up there in the truck but he's out here now and finding yesterday after running the qualifying period in the morning practice and he ran every lap he was just drenched in perspiration didn't think he was going to last the day in fact came back and was sick to his stomach for a couple of hours but AJ wanted to be here and when AJ wants to do something stand back the part of the wing on uh, Michael's car that was uh, hanging loose and uh, probably giving him most trouble has in fact departed from the car so he's got a single plane left front wing and uh, that may in fact stabilize the car for a bit Bobby Ray Hall as you can see has got around Rick Mears be interesting to see if he can catch up with these two. I think Mike Joy's got something for us. AJ Foyt's pit stop was very routine, just a set of tires and fuel, and it was right on schedule. They're sticking to the two pit stop under green philosophy. Supertech's looked okay. About the only thing he hasn't wanted to do all week is pose for a CBS headshot. Said, just got all my hair lopped off, and I don't want you to shoot me looking like this. So <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> you bet we didn't. <laughs> you bet I was going to carry the camera. That's for sure. So, Eddie Cheever now. Having his work cut out, Michael's found a slightly new lease of life as that offending flap has blown off. And there you see a tremendously tight race for fifth, sixth, and seventh, which is Mia Spidapoli and Al Unser, who has pulled right up onto them. The blue flag being shown there. Harry Lyon Dyke going around Hiro Matsushita. Matsushita, whatever we're supposed to call him. Here you see Eddie Cheever in, and we've got a spinner. Danny that Sullivan. Looks like Danny Sullivan in trouble. Of course, oh. goes the wrong way down. Gets it out of the way. Reverse. Sullivan had a chance of winning this race a couple of years back. Trying to get back in it now, driving the Alfa Romeo car. Patrick Racing. Danny Sullivan, who was running in 10th. AJ is back in another time. I think he's probably had about enough. He worked his way to 13th position at one time in the event with car number 14. Wants him to crank it back up. Get back out of here. Meanwhile, take a look at this. Here's Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi mixing it up. Penske team right behind them Al Unser yeah right behind him Mears Mears giving his teammate room there Emerson but I guess Emerson didn't feel that that was quite the place to try and make the pass Al getting down the inside he's had one unfortunate incident this afternoon but he is all over Emma like a cheap suit at the moment seventh and John Andretti right there eighth. Mario Andretti continues to pick people off slowly but surely from his uh, unfortunate incident with that flat tire uh, which happened as I said right in front of the pit so he had to do a full lap just limped around and lost a lot of time in fact he's only just in front of the leader but he's still picking people off into turn one with this battling trio here Battling, of course, for fifth, sixth, and seventh spot. 27 laps complete, 35 remaining in the Detroit Grand Prix. Tenth annual go. Harry Lyon, Knight with a large lead. There we see Mike Groff's car. That's the number 50 car. On the leaderboard by five by seven seven and nine ten seconds now lion dyke drawing away from michael andretti and stands a fair chance of lapping mario andretti in the next 10 laps or so he's only about three and a half seconds behind mario putting the elder of the family a lap down here's the contest it's mears Fittipaldi, unser and john andretti fourth to eight down past the punch train to the slowest corner here there we see Scott Brayton about to be lapped by the leader number nine Ari Lyon Dyke as they go onto the bridge Scott uh, Tony Benthausen's car is in fact a Penske a last year Penske with a Chevrolet 
one of the, uh, I guess a lot of people regard him as being somewhat fortunate to be able to get hold of the Chevrolet. But, uh, and that looks like our leader coming to the pit. Lion Dyke pitting. This will give Michael Andretti a chance to go back into the lead. Lion Dyke in. Four tires off. Four tires on. Fuel. And it's 12 and 6 tenths seconds. Good stop for a full stop. Um, at that stage, you'd have had to take on pretty much a full load of gas, uh, methanol, into turn one. Granatelli car back on the track. That Lola Chevy, whoop, bringing it up through the gears, is Ari Leyendijk, looking for his second win of the season. Had a fine run at Long Beach, got himself a fifth place there, then came back to win on the over. Phoenix, Arizona. A pretty convincing win. Drove well, dropped back a bit on his pit stop there, and uh, came right up. And what this has done is placed him in seventh on the leaderboard. Michael Andretti in first, Ray Hall in second, Mears to third, Fittipaldi fourth, Al Unser in fifth, John Andretti sixth, Lion Dyke seventh, and then comes Scott Brayton eighth, Scott Goodyear, and Willie T. Ribs is up to tenth place. Willie T. Ribs and uh, Scott Pruitt just having a tremendous dice out the window here, which I'm not supposed to be telling you about. Number three there, Rick Mears being followed by Emmo, Fittipaldi, his teammate. I think Emerson is being held up by Rick Mears, just somewhat. And I'm wondering what's happened to Al Jr., who was right behind him a moment ago. He must have had a little bit of indiscretion somewhere. There he is. He dropped back a bit. Now he's going to make a run up to them again. Woo! John Andretti slides it down there into the tunnel. Enjoying it. He, he likes a bit of sliding around. Mike Joy. Michael Andretti is in for his start. Uh, stop at the front of the car. Cart steward Bill Kampausen having a look at that wing. He says it's okay. It's on there. Secure. They are going to change the angle of the right front wing. Have a look here at the left front. Got an air hose they've got to pull out of the way. And away goes Mike a little longer stop than he'd like. But he's back out without having to replace that nose piece. And that will put number 18 Ray Hall into the lead. For the Pauli in second, Mears in third. And that's only the second lap that Ray Hall has led all year. Okay, Emerson Fittipaldi in the Penske car has got around his teammate Rick Mears. It'll be interesting to see now if he can pull away at all. I suspect he will. Uh, he was very quick in the morning's warm-up, which is always a big way of telling. And, of course, he's now hoping that uh, Rick Mears is as hard for uh, Al Unser to pass as he was. So, with this first period under caution that had been anticipated, Here's Bobby Ray Hall leading, Fittipaldi now in second, but being challenged hard by Mears. At Detroit, David Hobbs alongside, I'm Ken Squire, Chris Economaki, Mike Joy. Out on the racetrack, we're watching from Bobby Ray Hall's place, first place that is, the Detroit Grand Prix, which is now in its 31st of 62 laps. And there goes Unser. Al Unser Jr. screaming up on the bottom of the racetrack and making a move on Rick Mears for position. Putting himself into third spot. There you see the view from inside the cockpit into turn three. Under the bridge, bumping up the straight. There you can hear the engine note. Room, 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 as those back wheels go over. Tough on transmissions, this place. Very tough on transmissions, drive shafts, as well as the driver. So at halfway, it's Bobby Rahal out in front with Emerson Fittipaldi in second. Rick Mears now... Uh, losing out to Al Unser for third. Here's falling back, and John Andretti is in fifth. And here's Jeff Andretti's car number 86 having some problems. A car out of the Northwest trying to get that fired and not having much luck. That car owned by Bruce Levin, who I drove for and with on a few occasions. He and I came second at Elkhart Lake a few years back in the Porsche, but he decided to go the IndyCar route. And, of course, got himself some good sponsorship when he took on Jeff Andretti. Here's Chris Economaki. Well, we had a chance to look at Michael Andretti's front wing that they did not change. The wing is okay. It's the end plate on the left side that's missing. Perhaps David Hobbs should comment on whether that's a significant loss for Michael. He's a lap down now, right behind Harry Leyendijk. Those men that are out front, a lap ahead of everybody, are going to have to stop fairly soon for fuel. And that'll equalize the situation. Well, normally the end plate, and of course, he lost the secondary flap on the left side, too. So uh, I would have thought that the loss would be quite significant. 
but he certainly seemed to be holding his own when he was dicing against Eddie Cheever and uh, does not seem to be losing much time on the track. So uh, I'm amazed, like I say, if you raise or lower these cars as little as an eighth of an inch, it's very, very significant in terms of downforce, uh, which can be measured on these cars, and to lose the half of your left front wing uh, could make a lot of difference. I would have thought it would have made a tremendous difference. Michael Andretti is being shown the lead lap, being shown in seventh position here as we get to half the distance, and here you see Ray Hall in number 18, continuing to sustain that drive for first place in his first win of the year. Looks really good here at Detroit at the present time, and he's been consistent here in the past. Take a look at the running order after uh, 30 laps as you look back through the field, give you an idea of where some of your favorites may be. There you see the new wider, lower Craco Lola <coughs> compressed up into the top of the screen. If only they could be that way, they'd be really slick. Ray Hall himself now is coming under pressure from Emerson for the Pauli. For the Pauli got around his teammate, and I think you'll see uh, when we pull back a little bit that Emerson for the Pauli is in fact catching up with Ray Hall. This could make a very interesting race. There you see for the Pauli not so far behind. The last win for Ray Hall was at the Meadowlands. That was in 1989 as Guido Daco pulls off the course, slowing down in car number 33, the Italian driver. Ray Hall staying up in front. Emerson Fittipaldi, the 89 winner of this race, and that dramatic finish definitely closing ground as they come right below our broadcast location right here. Crossing the start-finish line there for the 33rd time is our Ray Hall. There's uh, Buddy Lazier in the 90 car. Here's Mike Joy. Well, they were pretty happy here in the Hemelgarn pit. Buddy Lazier had only completed 10 laps total in the three races he'd run this year, and he was running quite well. But now problems. The car is in. They're fueling it. This is not a scheduled pit stop, and they're going into the toolbox. Going to make an adjustment with an Allen wrench at the back of the car underneath the transaxle, possibly shifter problems for Lazier. And that's also, go ahead, Ken. And that's the same problem, Michael, they've had all week. I was down there with him yesterday, and great frustration on that team. He says it feels like the car buckles right in two for this ex gear out of Vail, Colorado. Well, still, it's the most laps they've run this year. And also, let's note Dennis Batolo, Ken. They'd only run a total of nine laps in two races as he's out there at midpoint and still running, so it's their best run of the season as well. Dennis Batolo really trying to give it a shot with a team that comes out of this part of the country out of Warren, Michigan. Bit of class driving there from Danny Sullivan. Real class driving. I mean, the guy is trying hard. Bobby Ray Hall, the leader, came up to him, being closely harried by Emerson Fittipaldi, and he really made a big effort to get out of the way of both those guys. But of course, Sullivan himself is running in 14th spot. Lazier has just brought his car number 90 back on the track, and look at this war for the lead. Oh, this is marvelous racing. Here's Ray Hall and Fittipaldi ready to get into it. Here's Mike Joy. Willie T. Ribs crew fitting four tires, and they're making an adjustment to the angle of the right front wing as well. Fueling is complete. Ribs refires it. We've got to pull the sideboard back to get him out of there. And he is gone after a somewhat leisurely tire change. And what a great run he's had, Mike. He is up, has been up to 12th position, so he's really cut some time through the field, and he just hasn't had much time in the cockpit of that machine. Here's the battle for the lead, and here Red comes Hall. Emerson looking inside and looking out as they're about to move on to St. Antoine. Not a good place to pass here. How would you like to uh, try a dice on Woodbridge, David? Not much. There you see the view out of Ray Hall's car as Emerson for the ball. He comes up through those two fast left-hand sweeps into, uh, there you see, <coughs> Mike Joy's clutch of manhole covers. Seems <laughs> to be growing as this race is progressing. Into the Congress area now. Very fast sweeps here. A lot of downforce exerted by these cars into 89 for the board he thinks about it. But you see, he can take a much tighter line. I think he's got more grip. His chassis, as the race is progressing, he seems to have got more grip. Has a good line off Bobian as they come on to, to uh, Larnard. And he hits Whoa. that bump and gets it loose, but he finds the hole. He took two of those manhole covers and had all four wheels off the ground. 
But now we have a changeup in front with Emerson Fittipaldi, the 89 winner at Detroit, leaping into the lead. Absolutely leaping into the lead. And Ray Hall, again, some class driving there. One thing about overtaking, as I said, a couple of little incidents we've seen this afternoon where people clearly were in the lead. But you also have to know when to give up. It's no good keeping that door closed forever until you put yourself and the other guy out. A uh, bit of good driving there for Bobby Ray Hall. Emerson make a great skier. He could handle those moguls. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, that's hard on the body and it's hard on the car. And it takes a lot of finesse to get the braking just right when all the wheels come off the deck like that. It's, uh, it's difficult to keep the car pointing in the right direction. Uh, one and seven eighths inches off the ground at 150 miles an hour. Just went right down through. Found the hole. And even though it uh, put him in a spot where that car was totally loose, airborne for a moment, he made the move into first place. Ray Hall takes second. Anser is there in third. Rick Mears is in fourth. John Andretti is fifth in the 10th annual Detroit Grand Prix. The Detroit Grand Prix, 36 laps have been completed. That remains 26 on the board. 65 miles left to decide it. And the 1989 champion, Emerson Fittipaldi, seeking his ninth road racing victory in CART PPG competition, is in first with Ray Hall right there in second. And here's the pass that made the difference. Fake to the outside, and then David, wow. Whoa, all four wheels off the ground there. And look, not a trace of smoke as he just brings in. Ray Hall wants to cut him off, but just can't quite bring himself to put these $300,000 machines into each other. Quality of, of, quality of, yeah, really. Kept his head there, both of them did. Now here's Ray Hall on pit road, falling back. Here's Mike. And it's a quick stop, Ken. Quickly, they've got the tires done. Uh, Tim got that Larry Elder. A little, little late with the fuel, but Ray Hall's away with a good quick stop. And right behind him, Al Unser Jr. gets in and out extremely quickly. I think Unser made up a good bit of ground there. That leaves Fittipaldi in front and puts John Andretti in second spot. The number four car just going by. John Andretti in second. Lion Dyke back up to third. He led earlier. Bobby Ray Hall. Comes out in fourth, Unser fifth, Michael Andretti in sixth, Rick Mears in seventh, Eddie Cheever is shown eighth, Scott Brayton is ninth, Mario Andretti is tenth. And there you see Michael Andretti just going past Rick Mears in the number three car and closing on Little Al in the number one car. Michael Andretti, of course, had his stop just a few laps ago when he adjusted the wing. Will he be able to keep going to the end? him at the present time and moving down Jefferson Poncha train hotel down by Cobo Hall Woo. The number five of Emerson Fittipaldi making his pit stop let's go to Mike scheduled stop for Fittipaldi here Rick Ritterman and Todd Hankinson the right side tires Kevin Chambers John Muslog the left sides fueling almost completed tire change is done Every drop in and Fittipaldi scoots away. Danny Sullivan in right behind him in the Alfa Romeo powered car, the Pat Patrick car, and this is also a scheduled stop for tires and fuel. No chassis adjustment. And there you see the John Andretti car that had been running in second. That one in as well. Stop on the leader was about 15 seconds for four tires and fuel, and John is back out as we swap some positions. Now here's the nine car. That's Ari Leyendike, who led earlier, back in front another time. Leyendike into the lead. Should be Emerson for second right there. And Bobby Ray Hall for third with Al Unser in fourth. Ari Leyendike uh, driving a good race there. As we saw, uh, Emerson, when he came into the pitch, made a bit of a bish of the approach. Got it all locked up. Came in, so he's made his approach slow, and it's not just the time that you're actually stopped changing wheels and tires and putting the fuel in these pit stops, it's getting in and getting out. And I think he was probably just a bit slow in with that approach. Now, then, the thing is, he made those adjustments on that caution flag just a few laps ago, and is he going to be able to uh, hang on to Ari Leyendike? 
The Lion Dyke for the moment has this advantage and he wheeled out in front earlier in the game, pulled away from Michael Andretti. They had a good dice for several laps. Then Michael made a move at the pump house turn that cost him part of the front wing. Lion Dyke pitted, fell back to seventh. He finds himself back in the lead with 38 of 62 laps complete on the streets of Detroit. There you see the 10 car. That is Ribs, and he is now shown in 14th as he continues to give the Cosby Walker car a very good run in its first road race appearance of the year. And right behind him, a furious race of Unsa Andretti and Ray Hall trying to catch this guy, Harry Lyondike, having a great afternoon. Seems to be pulling away from Emerson for the Pauli. One of the things that's been discussed by the CART PPG officials, Wally Dollenbach in particular, is coming up with a better control on pit road. And they told the drivers this morning that probably when they moved to Portland for the next race, they would come up with uh, some speed limits of around 90 miles an hour in the practice periods. Not on race day, but trying to make it a bit safer for those crews out there. There you see Eddie Cheever, who's running at six, working on Rick Mears. More of that story when we return. Let's take a look at this race story here. If you're just joining us, Michael Andretti sat on the pole by over a second over anyone and led 10 laps. Then there was a caution brought out when the Prappas car caught on fire. You saw how they rolled through there. Bobby Rahal took over for a bit. Emerson Fittipaldi and Ari Leyendijk is now back in control at uh, the 40 lap mark and rolling away. Leyendijk continuing in first place. And Ari Leyendijk is putting daylight between himself and Emerson Fittipaldi, but with the way their pit stops fell, can Ari Leyendijk finish this race without another quick dash in for some fuel? We think that Emerson Fittipaldi does not have to stop again. Lapping 12th place Scott Pruitt here, or attempting to do so. There we see Eddie Cheevan, the eight car, coming down the inside of Rick Mears into turn three. There's that concrete slippery close together there as they go under the old Molson's Bridge. And Eddie Cheever picks up another place, putting himself up to fifth on the track. Eddie, I think, also can probably complete the distance. How tough is this course today? Chris Economac, he has someone with him that can show you. Uh, we're sitting here with Mike Groff, 29-year-old driver who went out of the race when his engine seized up. Let's see your palm of your hand, Mikey. This is less than half the distance for Mike Groff, and he's got this blister. Mike, what makes the track so tough on your hand? Well, I'll tell you, here at Detroit, we do about 150-some-odd shifts during a lap, and, you know, it's upshifting and downshifting, a lot of braking, and this track's just the roughest track we run all year. The humidity really hurts us, too, and I imagine those guys are wilting out there right about now. Oh, it's too bad. You made your debut here a year ago, finished 15th. One year in IndyCar racing. You happy with yourself? Well, so far it hasn't gone too bad, but I would like to finish the race. I mean, we're one for five so far this year, and we're off to a pretty rocky start at the moment. Well, better luck next time. Let's go now to Mike Joy. Alan Sears Jr. has had to make an extra unscheduled pit stop. They had a problem in the fueling mechanism of the car. The nozzle that comes down from this large tank, they keep it wrapped up to protect it so it doesn't get banged around, but something happened and it jammed and wouldn't flow all the fuel into the car. So he had to come back in to completely drain this big dump tank. That's all the fuel they're allowed in the car for the duration of the race. Now he's got a full load and can finish for that extra stop will cost him. This track just not very pleasant place for Al Unser. One of the other things, of course, that makes your hands go like that, you know, you wear these big fireproof gloves, which are very thick, and of course you perspire profusely underneath all that garb, you know, the full fireproof kit, the helmet, the gloves, and of course your hands get absolutely soaking wet with sweat. And uh, that doesn't, so the more glove you put on, the worse it gets. Well, they take them up like fighters' hands now to try to protect those palms. But in 17 laps in a training mission out here the other day, Scott Pruitt had blisters. 17 laps. Ooh, never see Roberto Guerrero. That's a big fighting group. Couldn't quite see the rest of them. Well, Be I think Bettenhausen's in that group, and they're fighting for 16th spot. Mashusta's back in that crowd, too. We've got a report that that corner that Leyendijk just went round, turn 10, and one of the ones coming up turn 13 are breaking up like they did yesterday afternoon, which is no surprise if they break up one day. 
almost this one here is supposed to be breaking up a bit. Look at the Cavalier Manor that Lion Dyke just throws that car around, David. He is having a grand time. Now, here's Machusa on pit road, car number seven, which is running in 15th position. Lion Dyke looks like he really is enjoying the day and the ride in the Granatelli car. Certainly does make the day a lot better when one is leading. As Scott Pruitt said yesterday, Mike. Machusta is away, and these stops are a little longer than the first round of pit stops, Ken and David, because they have to completely drain that dump tank to get their full fuel allotment in. That tank is now only half full of when it started the race, and gravity will trickle it down, and those last few drops are precious, and you need to make sure you get them all in. But his best finish last week at Milwaukee, or last race rather, 10, and having a good run here today. 43 laps are complete, 107 miles, 19 laps to go, just 47 and a half miles to the checkered flag in the 10th annual Detroit Grand Prix with Holland's Lion Dyke leading in that TZAC car. annual Detroit Grand Prix. Interesting story. Lion Dyke has found himself the lead once again. Fittipaldi, the 89 champion, has come back to second. Looking back through the field, Scott Goodyear, the young Canadian, is up to 10th spot. Mario Andretti holding on in ninth. Rick Mears running a steady six at this time. 44 of 62 laps have been completed. With Mark. David Hobbs, I'm Ken Squire. Top side, Mike Joy. and Here's the leader. Let's go to Mike Joy. Ari Leyendijk rolls that car to a halt right on the markers, and quickly Jim Wilson has the car in the air. Bruce Anderson trying to get every drop of fuel in there as Davis Cameron stands at 11. Change the tires. Tires are done. Watching those last drops come down through that clear hose, and away he goes. 13.7 seconds. Great stop. Tremendous stop. The others have been in around 15 to 17 seconds. Some of the second go around. Lion Dyke having a great run here today. Five lead changes, incidentally, is a record for Indy cars here at Detroit. And that's what we've seen thus far. It's about to get changed again. Emerson Fittipaldi now with a substantial lead over Ari Lion Dyke. And we don't think that Fittipaldi is going to have to stop again. He stopped with 25 laps to go. Uh, did his last stop, so he should be okay. Only 17 laps since his last stop on Lion Dyke. There's the number five car. Fittipaldi finds himself up in front. Michael Andretti is now second. Bobby Rahal is third. Lion Dyke fourth. Eddie Cheever to fifth. Rick Mears is in sixth. And there are six lead changes recorded as Lion Dyke made that pit stop. There we see Eddie Cheever. Gentleman that uh, we didn't mention a moment ago, but well should. The Dean of American Race Casters, Chris Economaki. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're looking at some people in the grandstands here, Ken. This race is uh, not certain to continue. The organizers of the race say they have a three-year contract about to be signed with CART, but the stipulation is that the race may not be held here in the streets of downtown Detroit. Construction will, could very well stand in the way of the continuance of this event. And I, though we don't think this one will be the last race, it certainly can't go on for too many more years. So an alternate site is being sought. Perhaps the fairgrounds, perhaps Belle Isle, but somewhere in greater Motown, they want a race, but it can't be downtown for too many more years. Construction continuing around the Renaissance Center is, is the issue, but it sure is fun to see them run down by the Detroit River. Chris, how many years ago were you out at the fairgrounds? Oh, Ken, <laughs> let's see. I don't think I had a driver's license. <laughs> what a cruel question to ask a man. <laughs> it will be a shame to lose it, because although the drivers complain about the roughness and this sort of thing, I drove here a couple of times in Trans Ams, and it really is a very interesting track to drive on. And uh, But up right downtown here, the main paddock area and grandstand area is really destined one of these days to have a large building on it. And uh, obviously, we'll lose the site. There you see M.O. <coughs> going through 8 and 9, past the Union Jack there on the corner. Must be a group of English people there. Not many English people in this race to root for, but pretty well every car except the True Sports is of British origin. John Andretti's number four, shown in seventh position. Looking for Rick Mears out there, and it's a lonely look right now. The car that won the first race of the season on the Gold Coast in Australia. First time out with that new team, Jim Hall, the BDS team. What an outstanding run that was. And they said that with the track as bumpy here as Australia, they thought they would be a formidable opponent for all the rest of these 24 starters. But that's not the way it's worked out. He finds himself 
looking up with Mears, Cheever, Leyendike, Ray Hall, Andretti, Fittipaldi in front of him at this time. He's certainly not out of the hunt. <coughs> He's on the lead lap. Uh, so it doesn't take much, you know, to get yourself up near the front as long as you can stay on that all-important lead lap. John and I drove together in 1986 for the BMW team. There you see that track break up to the left there. You can see the marbles all appearing on the left, so if anybody gets offline there, uh, they're going to be in trouble. Bettenhausen, Tony Bettenhausen, the number 16, or the uh, number 16, is running in the 16th position, is about to be lapped. A report from Mike Joy. Well, Bruce Levin owns the Jeff Andretti car, and Bruce, you tried to make this a one pit stop race, and darn it, it almost didn't work for you. Got close, got really close. Was, we had to push it in the bit for the pit stop. Just didn't make it. So it was, uh, we tried real hard. A great gamble. Now you've had to stop again? Now we got a gearbox problem. So it's just out there trying to finish. They rolled the dice, and uh, they only came within a straightaway of making it on one pit stop here today. <laughs> oh, Bruce always was a bit of a gambler. And a great sportsman. And it has a very attractive wife as well. Get it all in. Make, <laughs> make some good sandwiches. Enjoy driving for the, the Bayside 11 team. Some brakes wearing on at uh, 47 of 62 laps complete. And there you see the Dennis Vitolo car in trouble. That's that car out of Warren, Michigan, car number 39. Trying to get a crank once again, hoping to have a good day here. Those are all local sponsorships. There's a dentistry on the uh, the back of it. Looks like a stock car for Saturday night kind of sponsor, David. Man, get your teeth knocked out here pretty quick. And that's one of the corners that's supposed to be breaking up. The corner workers trying to get him out of the way. Put some lock on it, Dennis. That's it. Turn the wheel. That's what it's for, lad. <laughs> You're terrible. You're just terrible. Dennis is out now there. Now turn it the other way while they push you backwards. <laughs> Other way. We'll return with more live coverage of the Valvoline Detroit Grand Prix after this message and a word from your local station. With 48 of 62 laps complete here in the Detroit Grand Prix, Emerson Fittipaldi trying for that second victory here is in the lead with Andretti in second, Ray Hall third, Lion Dyke fourth, and Eddie Cheever maintaining fifth. It's Mears in sixth, and we're coming to a full course caution at this moment. Here's John Andretti in seventh, Al Unser Jr. eighth, and Mario Andretti's car in trouble, and Michael's car has come to a stop, and the whole track is blocked. We're under a full course caution, and what has happened is the Dennis Vitolo car that we were talking about as we went to commercial, they brought out that safety vehicle to move that car, and I believe that Mario has run into the safety vehicle. Mario ran into it, and it looks like Michael ran into Mario, and now Bobby Rahal's stuck there as well. Red flag's out. The whole thing's going to come to a halt. Red flag is halted as this safety vehicle, which is something that you have questioned several times about having these things darting and dodging around the track, uh, has put us in a situation where we are going to a red flag, a red flag condition. Michael getting out of the car there, going to go and have words with his dad, gesticulating. I, you look at them. A lot of Italian being spoken in that corner right now. We don't know what happened because Vitolo had trouble getting away from that position, and we don't know whether the safety vehicle has arrived there or not. But obviously, let's take a look. In. Maybe we maybe we can this find out. This is one right of the here. corners that's breaking up, by the way. So these drivers may have found it difficult to stop. And here we see a replay. And everybody gets through safely. And here comes the safety vehicle. And pretty much in the line. Guerrero getting through. This was taped moments ago. on the other side to alert him there was a condition on the other side of the corner but right in the line was that safety vehicle and, and there's Michael getting into it well now Michael and Mario to be really I mean everybody else got through then it's Fatolo back signaling the cars behind and Ray Hall has to come to a complete halt so we are under a red flag Full course red. 
Emerson Fittipaldi in the lead. Michael Andretti in second. Bobby Rahal in third. Lion Dyke in fourth. And the race is red flagged. And Michael Andretti kaput. Mario Andretti's car out. And here's where it all came untethered in the 10th annual Detroit Grand Prix. Strike Mario Andretti from ninth and Michael from second. Fittipaldi would be your leader. Ray Hall had been running in third. Red flag condition. We'll see what develops from here. And while they were waiting for the traffic to get cleared, look what happened to car number 90 out here. That's Buddy Lazier's car out of uh, Vail, Colorado. I guess he didn't like standing. There we see from the onboard camera of Bobby Ray Hall shaking his head saying, what the heck is going on? Here's Mike Joy. Well, I'm in the Andretti pit where there is considerable confusion. Owner Carl Haas and his team just had a look at it on our replay on the monitors down here on pit road. They've not talked to Mario, and the reason is the antenna for the two-way radio is located in the nose piece just about the height of that safety truck's bumper. Michael's car, which spun off into the Vitolo machine, they are trying to get back to pit road and get him back in the race. So you see all sorts of tools here at the ready. In the event, one or both Andretti's can make it back to pit lane. Well, we'll be back with more under a red flag condition. There are 50 of 62 laps complete. And more on the story of this unusual Detroit Grand Prix in a moment. We're back with you live here in Detroit, Michigan, where the 10th annual Valvoline Detroit Grand Prix is in a red flag condition after one of the most unusual altercations that we've witnessed. Here's what happened. Dennis Vitolo's car had stopped. They were going to pick it up with a safety car. And Mario Andretti socks into the back of it. And then shortly thereafter, as they came out to administer to Mario Andretti, Michael probably saw his dad had completely blocked the road just at the last minute he'd be coming up the hill from three to turn four here was going to swing wide right suddenly saw the road blocked although that car there seemed to have got away with it okay and uh, the next thing is that Michael runs out of room and he's collected in this incident like father like son so the entire race has been uh, there's Michael's car coming into it and the track is entirely blocked, and the situation now is that lined up behind where this incident has taken place is the entire rest of the field. Now, this is a live picture just in back of that corner where this incident happened, and we'll show you exactly where it happened. It was in the turn four area, which is where you uh, drive up St. Antoine and make a hard right hand on a wood bridge. That's where the incident took place, at turn four, here of the Detroit Grand Prix two and a half mile course. When the race resumes, they had shown 50 laps complete. It will go back one to 49. 62, the distance for the race. There you see the Bettenhausen car, John Andretti, Al Unser Jr., Cheever all lined up down there. And there was absolutely no place to go. It was impassable. Now, unlike uh, racing in Europe, I see everybody in the pits is working on their cars. Of course, normally under a red flag situation, you can't work on the car, which of course is, is pretty fair because it means it's very unfair on these people who are stuck out on the track and can't work on their cars, while the people in the pits can. Willie Ribb's car coming around. Let's go to Chris. Well, this is a kind of a situation that also leads to possible scoring problems down the road. Who is where when all this took place and who passed who before he stopped and so forth. So I can see that the outcome of this race not being decided until the wee hours of the morning behind, of course, the winner. Now, there's more up to the story, and Mike Joy has it. Well, I'm with Carl Haas, who owns both the Andretti cars. Have you ever seen anything like this? No, I can't remember. I have, no. Well, I know the purpose of these safety trucks is to be out there, remove cars, and make the course safer for the drivers. Is this an isolated incident, or might this procedure have to be looked at? Well, I don't really know what happened. I haven't been out there. I haven't seen it. Uh, the safety truck idea has always got some danger involved in it. <clears throat> Sooner or later, I knew somebody's going to run, run into it. I guess it happened this time. I don't know what the flagging was like out on the course, and I haven't spoken to the drivers yet. So we'll just see. Well, if they go back a lap, they're saying they're going to go back a lap and restart the race, which, if your drivers get back, would put them both back into contention. Well, I don't know if the cars are fixable right now or not. Doesn't look like Michael's is. Michael's back in the pit here, and there's no car. So I guess his is not fixable. I don't know about Mario yet. And it's okay. 
It's the old Saturday night question, Mike. Are the cars involved? Are they the ones that go to the back of the field? We'll see in this most extraordinary Detroit Grand Prix in a moment. Stay with us here on CBS. We are under a red flag condition. One of the men involved is standing by with Mike Joy. He is hot, Ken, and it's not just the weather. Michael, what happened there? Well, there should have been a full course yellow thrown, and there wasn't. Um, came around there. It was a local yellow for a while, and we knew what the position of the car. But uh, then we come around the next time, and here poor, my poor dad stuffed underneath the truck. And uh, I came around. I was in first gear because I, I was taking it easy because I thought, you know, that there was a little trouble, and, I mean, there was nowhere to go. And I hit the Tolo's car and, you know, two, total two Newman Austin cars for nothing. I mean, they moved the stalled car from where it was to the other side of the racetrack into the line? And in, right into the line. The truck was right into the line. And my dad nailed the truck. So, Is he okay? I mean, it's a totally, totally blind corner. I mean, you have no idea what's around the next corner. And, uh, uh, you know, there should have been a full course yellow. And, uh, yeah, dad is all right. He's, we were, reported he's on his way back to his pit. Sorry to have fate steal one from you here today. Thanks. Here's Mario. Mario Andretti indeed coming in all in all not a very good day for the Andrettis here in Detroit Mario back on pit road nor for Paul Newman and Carl Haas the owners of that team who had such high hopes all weekend long after Michael's great performance in taking the pole and you can see the damage on Mario's car David well, the, look front too the front suspension looks remarkably underrange you can see how the front wing must have gone right under the truck never touched it at all and it's just buried itself into the top part of the front body there and with only just a few laps to go in this race 13 odd laps to go I can see them putting some tape over that hole and uh, he can run up Mike Joy with Mario Andretti well, Mario's out of the car and he's getting a cold drink of water he's watching the work continue on the car and it looks as if there's a good chance that they can get this car back into the race and as we told you the radio took a direct hit and the sound you hear is a hacksaw that they're using to remove the left front suspension the upright on the car to hopefully get him back in Mario are you okay all right he'll give us a nod and watch the work continue and help direct repairs to the Newman Haas Lola Of course, it just depends now how long they maintain this red. Um, whether they give these guys, in fact, enough chance uh, to get these cars back into at least some sort of a race-ready state. Well, there is a clock running. I believe it's 15, 20 minutes. It gets us back to a condition to line them back up and send them out once the course has been cleared. And, of course, we have all those cars back there that... Uh, still have to be brought around that were parked back there. Uh, here comes the 39 car where it all began. He was running way back on the tail end of the field when all of this frack car started. Dennis Patolo was shown well out of contention. He was back in 20th spot, several laps down. And Mario, is, you can see here, is angry and does not want to go on television, but to his crew, he's letting them know in no uncertain terms how unhappy he is about what has happened to this team today the entire team eliminated in this incident that happened on the corner of Woodbridge and St. Antoine here in the streets of Detroit mean streets indeed for the Andretti Fed look again at what happened there you see Mario coming around the corner full lock on car not responding at all because the front wheels are locked up <coughs> so he has no steering way at all Somebody else gets through there. I can't work out who that was still. But, um, now, they have two of these vehicles that are alike, the number one and the number two, and they switch positions all the way around the track. In other words, there's one equidistant on this two-and-a-half-mile course, and if one is called in the service, the other one moves around. So there is a lot of movement of these vehicles, and it does give you a heart throb to see yeah. them out there with these cars zipping by at 150 160 miles an hour it certainly it's looked though as if michael arrived on the scene just a little bit too quick uh for all he says and seeing his dad there online he took a handful of left hand lock to try and miss his dad and of course ran into the other car but of course as they say it's easy to say that sitting in here what what is first gear worth on this track how fast first gear oh 60 mile an hour. back with more from detroit in a moment
We're back with you live at the Detroit Grand Prix. And as the old song says, it's a most unusual day this Father's Day. We have a red flag condition because the field was entirely blocked when a safety car removing a car that had come to a stationary position on the track was caught up by the Paul Newman, Carl Haas team. Both cars eliminated in the incident that took place at turn four, the corner of St. Antoine and Woodbridge here in Detroit. So we're in the red flag situation. The drivers are back in the pit area. They are going to full fuel tanks, getting set for the resumption of the race, which we believe will come with 49 laps of the 62 completed. They were in the 50th lap. We think they'll roll one back. Here you see Emerson Fittipaldi, who is the current leader in the Penske Chevy, clambering out of those very warm duds. Take a look at the uh, standings as they were after 49 laps with Fittipaldi then first. Michael was in second, Ray Hall in third, Lion Dyke, Eddie Cheever having a good day in fifth. Emerson Fittipaldi looking to me so amazingly unfazed at what can only for him be an unfortunate turn of events because with 13 laps to go, he had a 10 second lead on certainly the second fastest car out here, Harry Lyondyke, which may well have been the fastest car out here, but the fact remains that um, Emerson Fittipaldi pretty well had it locked up. Well, of course, this is going to be a whole new race when they start again. And uh, I can't believe how sort of cheerful he looks. He's obviously explaining the accident as some sort of bizarre, comical affair that happened out there, which when you look at it, it was pretty, uh, pretty bizarre anyway. To Mike Joy. Well, Dennis Vitolo was indirectly, not the cause of that, but it was your car that they were attempting to tow. And would you explain to us, it conflicts a little with what Michael said, how they had moved your car, begun to move it once they hooked you up? Yes, they pu pushed my car back first, and then we moved forward to the left side, uh, parallel along the wall. Uh, it was sort of nosed in a little bit. Uh, we backed it up, moved the parallel, the safety truck came around, hooked up the rope, and we just started to get, uh, I believe the driver was just getting back in the truck to start pulling me. Uh, Myra came around, hit the back of the truck, and then a few moments later, Michael came around and hit the back of my car. How's your car now? What, what happened to it first to put you out, and how is it now? Well, the car just went up on a new set of tires, locked the brakes, and as I went to blip the throttle, the engine stalled, and I just sort of got stuck there for a moment. And my car, I don't believe, is too bad. I, I believe it just back uh, bent one rear corner, the right rear. Okay, what do you think about this idea of trucks going out, hauling cars in? I mean, usually it's to make the car safer for everybody, and today it just didn't work out that way. It's difficult. On a street circle like this, I mean, obviously I didn't want this to happen, and it's very unfortunate of all the people that hit me, the leader of the race. I mean, I'm very sorry about that, but it's not something I've done intentionally, but it's a problem with street courses and the system we have. It, the system can't always be perfect. They do the best they can do. Okay, Dennis Vitolo. And Ken, uh, Ken, two things about that. One, you heard Carl Haas talk about the flagging, and he hadn't seen how the flagging was. The SCCA flaggers, they'll throw a waving yellow. They'll also have a white flag for the emergency vehicle. And many times, uh, especially on the permanent courses, they will wave the drivers or point the drivers uh, with neon-colored gloves which way to go entering the corner. Now, Detroit's very tough because of the fencing that lines the concrete barriers. There are only so many access holes for those flaggers to get out and be able to signal to the drivers. So it's entirely possible that the Andretti's had no idea where that car and where that truck was when they entered that blind corner. We'll head back up to Newman Haas, see if we can get further word from Mario. Well, thank you, Mike. I'd like to uh, check in with Chris Economaki for a moment. Chris, no one has seen when more races. Race Chris, no one has seen any more races than, yeah. than the Lord except for you. Do you ever recall anywhere on any of those half-mile tracks or quarter-mile tracks, anything like this? Well, yes, I've seen a lot of jam-ups like that, but my, my thinking now is what's going to happen when the green flag comes out again. These cars have been in here a long time. They've made all the adjustments they need to get the car just right for the rest of the race. Fill it up with fuel, no more pit stops. Emerson Fittipaldi, Ari Leyendike, Eddie Cheever, John Andretti, Bobby Rahal are all going to be in it nose to tail when this flag comes down. I think we're going to see a while finish of this race it's going to be like a sprint race and it can be anybody's event particularly these cars are so aerodynamically uh, in technically sophisticated that a bolt on a wing turned a half a turn too much makes the car no good or a half a turn too little makes the car no good so the crews that have the bolts on right and the Penske crew is noted for that it's going to make 
the man go a lot, a lot faster. Summerson Peter Pally's up there. I think that he, Ray Hall, and Leyendike are going to have quite a duel when this thing gets underway once again. Strange day here at Detroit, and Chris is predicting that we're going to have a shootout right to the finish. We're going to see shortly. They've pretty much got the uh, track cleared away, and the count continues towards a restart in the Detroit Grand Prix. Red flagged after one of the most unusual incidents I believe has ever been televised at a motorsports event. Right now, we expected to interview someone in Victory Lane. Instead, everyone is on pit road, working on their cars, getting ready for the resumption of the 10th annual Detroit Grand Prix. They'll go back one lap for a restart order, and they'll start on lap 49. And in that case, here's how they were running. Emerson was first with Michael second, Bobby Rahal third. Dyke in fourth, followed by Cheever and Mears. These are all in the lead lap. John Andretti, Al Luncer Jr. up there. Mario was in ninth, and Scott Goodyear, the young Canadian in tenth. Scott Pruitt had brought that true sports car all the way back to 11th, and 13th was Willie T. Ribb, still cutting some very good laps out here in his efforts with the Bill Cosby Walker car. Here's the remainder of the field as we prepare for a restart, and it's still some time away. They're refueling, checking these cars, and as we see them down below, now several of these cars, of course, have been retired. Let's go to Mike Joy for a couple of comments here. Ken Mario Andretti is back aboard his Newman Haas Lola. You see they've got a Saturday night special taped up number on the nose of that car. A lot of duct tape covering up the damage from the bumper of the safety truck, and they had to replace the left upper front suspension on Mario's car, do a little quick alignment. Now they were going to roll him out, but I guess we're still a few minutes away here from the start. He kind of declined comment, was obviously very hot, as was son Michael, over the whole incident, which I think is all but unprecedented in this type of racing. Another look at that incident, which has resulted in most unusual and bizarre circumstance. There's Mario's car plowing into the back of the safety truck. And within another 20 seconds, around comes Michael, sees his dad, Turns it full lock and catches Dennis Patolo's car number 39. Gives it a good shot. Now you could hear from the car that preceded Michael that whoever it was was coming up that hill at a pretty good lick because they'd, they'd changed gear coming up the hill and back to uh, third or second because of the yellow flag probably. But as Mike Joy said, it's difficult for the marshals. You can see all the catch fencing there uh, above the walls. It's difficult for the marshals themselves. They only have certain access holes to wave the flag through. Well, looking back over the years, and we've been here every year but one, the, the marshal work on this track has always been excellent. Uh, they've done an outstanding job with what they've had to work with. So That car that squeezed through, we're told, was in fact Emerson Fittipaldi, who was leading the race, and he seemed to control, uh, handle the situation pretty well. The weird thing is, of course, that uh, for Mario himself, who was very much involved in that, he was about to stop for a pit stop. Uh, and now, of course, he's had a pit stop here, so in fact, he would probably have dropped a lap down, now he won't. There you see Eddie Cheever waiting to get back into this thing. He's in fifth place. Here's Mike. <laughs> and uh, Eddie is looking a little cooler now that he's got a cold drink and an umbrella. You know, probably the worst thing about this red flag type situation is where the driver has to just sit in that car and wait and take all the heat that he's generated, the heat energy, from fighting the car around this course and just have all the heat and sweat pour into his suit. Now he's pouring some water on to get a little bit of momentary respite from that heat. Cheever, as we said, started the race with a blistered right thumb. He says that is of no concern. Winning this race is. He feels fine and fit. Last year's third place finisher is just waiting like the rest of us to get restarted. It bears up what David Hobbs has said about racing. He says sometimes it's what? 95% boredom and 5% stark terror. We just had the stark terror, and now we're waiting again and, and getting ready for resumption of the race, and some of the folks here are taking this opportunity to head for the concessions and then get themselves back in their seats for what Chris Economaki says will be a dandy shoot-up, and I believe he's right. And while they're headed out to pick up something to eat right now, race drivers are always searching for a little edge on going faster. And Chris Economaki went out, found himself a report which he could really get into. Comes to grabbing a bite to eat. Fast food is getting slower, but better is his in report. In the old days, when a racing driver got hungry, all he could do was get in line with the fans for a tube steak. 
racetrack parlance for a hot dog or some soggy Italian sausage. No more. Welcome to Racing's Restaurant Row, where four-star dining is part and parcel of today's big-time racing. Say bonjour to Chris Jurgensen, Jeff Andretti's team chef. While Jeff is out tearing up the track, Chris and his sous chef, Mike Moore, are busy preparing a gourmet lunch. What is on today's menu? Today we have escalope de veau, Parisian, with uh, pasta with fresh basil, zucchini and yellow squash with pimento. Why go to all this expense? Well, successful armies march on a full stomach. Successful reins or esteems work harder. Jeff, you like it? Love it. Great. Is this food intimidating? You ever wish for franks and beans? Ah, this is great. The best. Pasta the best. Good for you. What would you do if your driver pushed aside the Escalope de Vaux Parmesan and asked for franks and beans? Well, we got it. I'm going, as we say in the pits, to refuel. Now, back to the race. Bon appetit. Hey, Chris, how does everything taste? Not bad, but it could use a sousson of ketchup. <laughs> Successful journalists always find their way to the people with the best food. Absolutely. Yeah. Just cracks you right up, doesn't he? Paul Newman looking on and not being too comfortable with the way this day has unfolded here in Detroit as his two cars have both sustained damage in this incident at turn number four. Let's take a look. Uh, incidentally, report that they brought out the fuel truck and 2.8 gallons of fuel is being added get them home from here they're going to back up to lap 48 in fact not to 49 and um, so every car is going to get 2.8 gallons additional fuel to finish this race here you see the record of six lead changes which is a record for the cart cars at Detroit among four drivers and you can throw away the average speed at 78 race record is 84 technical laps none counting technical time none counting here Seven cars have retired from the 25 that started the event. Now let's take a look at the summary of how this race has gone. If you're just joining us, we were rocketing along in pretty good shape. Michael Andretti had come off the pole and led, and we had a caution period for Prappas out on the track. He had a bit of a fire in his car. Michael uh, led till the 13th lap, and then Lion Dyke made a great move and took over. Michael Andretti came back and led at uh, lap 28, but it was a very short period he was in the lead, and then Bobby Rahal took command, followed by Emerson Fittipaldi as they were making some pit stops. Lion Dyke back for the lead, and here we are with Emerson Fittipaldi out in front another time, and then a red flag multi-car wreck brings us to a halt for a while here at Detroit and we get ready to go once again we believe within the next five or ten minutes well you're looking here at the cart bus it's the door is closed and inside a high-level meeting is in progress involving a Bill Stokan the Norwegian gentleman who ran Playboy merchandising the new chairman of cart Bob McCabe, the president of Detroit Renaissance, the organizers and promoter of this race, and officials of championship order racing teams over this episode that has brought this race to a stop. I guess they're trying to find out whether it's an embarrassment or not uh, with the safety truck in there blocking the lane. However, one car did get by, and that certainly will be a subject of conversation in the days to come. We've asked uh, some gentlemen from this bus to come to us, but this meeting continues to go on and on, and I suspect it'll go on until the race resumes. For certain, Chris, this will be one that everybody will remember and talk about, this extraordinary race. That one car, incidentally, that went by was Emerson Fittipaldi, who hopes to win this one and give Brazil six out of ten Detroit races, all won by either Senna or Emerson Fittipaldi. Let, let's go, or uh, one other. Let's, let's go down to Mike Joy for a moment. Well, here in the John Andretti pits, there are tons of talent. Jim Hall with the Shane Chaparral cars, who runs this team with Franz Weiss, the legendary engine builder. And this man, who services may be needed before the day is out, Kerry Agajanian, whose dad had winning cars on the IndyCar circuit and who ran Ascot Park, and he's the lawyer. 
Wow, we're going to need a good lawyer to maybe to sort this one out. This is kind of a tough one. You've got fellows out there trying to do a job and clear the course and make it safe, and yet here come racers into a blind corner, and you, and you slide them around. Uh, do we go see Judge Wapner, or what do we do? No, we'll keep the lawyers out of this, Mike. This is really for racers. Uh, it's hard on a road course like this. Those things happen when you have uh, safety vehicles trying to move people off and drivers still trying to race, uh, those things happen. We don't see this on the oval so much, but uh, at least John Andretti is still in here, and we're, we're, we're going to keep him going. I know as a kid you used to tune in and listen to Chris on the wireless, but I know you've seen a lot of races in your time. Have you ever seen anything this weird? No, this is quite, quite strange. I, uh, of course, most of the time, uh, while I was growing up, we never had street course racing anyway, and we were always on the well, oval. Well, we did, just nobody sanctioned it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, uh, this, is, this is quite strange, and uh, we're, we're just uh, real happy that John got through this thing now for all the short track fans around the nation who are wondering we're just talking about Ascot Park that great facility that your family ran for so many years and it fell to the bulldozer and to the developers will there be another Ascot Park in Southern California well I really believe there will I can't tell you when Mike but uh, there has been an Ascot in Los Angeles in a, since about 1912 and actually there have been four Ascots and we're hoping that the Agajanian family will build a fifth we don't know when but uh, we're working on it, and we'll make an announcement as soon as we have property lined up. Well, I'll leave you my deposit now for the first ticket. We sure hope so. Uh, you, we have a place okay. for you anytime, uh -huh. Mike. Thank you. Kerry Agajanian. Get me that second ticket, Mike. Well, men's track and field, women's track and field, isn't it, coming up next on CBS? Men's and women's this afternoon. Outdoor track and field championships in the University of Oregon. They're what's next this afternoon here on CBS after we complete the Detroit Grand Prix. That's right after... We thought we'd be going there right now or about now, and that's not to be the case. We will have 48 laps completed as we get ready to roll once again toward that mark of 62. That'll tell the story. Pushing the cars back onto the track now. <clears throat> and, of course, we've already got some more controversy about Mario himself, whether or not he's going to lose a, a lap as a result of that fracas, because if they revert the scoring to two laps before the crash, obviously the fact that he was part there for a lap while everybody went by him doesn't count anymore and uh, which will play right into his hands because he was about to make a pit stop anyway, which would have lost him, you know, three quarters of a lap yeah. anyway. Just about to go a lap down, and he gets his car fixed, but we don't know, nor does he, exactly what the condition of that mount will be until they drop the flag another time. Back in Detroit, the red flag situation continues. I'm with Bob Pearson, the race chairman for the Sports Car Club of America. They're responsible for the flaggers out on the course, and you can update us on what flags were waving where at that incident. Right. The incident, Mike, was at turn four. Standard procedure would be to have a double yellow waving at three. Uh, I'm sorry, at four, a single waving yellow the turn before at three, and a white at four to say that there was a slow, that the cart safety vehicle was out, and those were in place. Now, so I don't know what exactly happened that uh, that uh, caused Mario to hit the truck but now uh, they first they first tried to push the Vitolo car they tried to the turn people tried to push it or pull it back out of the way and it was just the it was locked up whether it was because the engine was hot or the trans was locked but they couldn't do it by hand so it was either pick it up with a tow truck or have the cart safety vehicle come out and tow it out and that's the decision was to have the cart guys tow it out okay last question were they motioning or motioning or pushing the drivers toward either side yeah. of the racetrack that's automatic i mean that okay. that's automatic frankly to protect my people who are out there okay that's bob pearson with the scca in charge of the flaggers at the event it all began when uh, Gino and John Gagliano's car came to rest up in turn number four, and its driver, Dennis Vitola, was out of the machine. We're now given a time of about eight minutes before they'll restart the 10th annual Valvoline Detroit Grand Prix. Let so the Gagliano me. brothers from Warren, Michigan, came down here with great aspirations for this. They entered the car under the entry of Dale Coyne to save a dollar or two, got a dentist to sponsor the car, and they were having a pretty good day for a while, and now they will go down in history. If anybody gets near Mario or Michael Andretti, they could well need a dentist in the next year. <laughs> have all their front teeth. I have also given you duff information. I told you that Mario was about to make a pit stop. Well, of course, I wasn't watching properly. He'd made it about five laps before, so uh, that will uh, that could put him a lap down. But was about to go a lap down. But this will tighten that field back together, so it's a double advantage to Mario as he comes back out. He'll be with the field, and they've had a chance to fix the car. It would be just a little bit alarming to him, having seen a man attack his front suspension with a hacksaw. Uh, it can't be too confidence in stealing. You see Al Unser Jr. standing there as they continue the 
One of the guys who probably come out of this car. best of all, actually, is Al. Little Al here, by it'll it'll bunch him right up with that lead group. He was a fair way out of the lead, so this will help him. But he's in eighth. Chris Economaki is standing by with Mario. Oh, Mario, thank you very much for coming up here moments before the race started. We didn't, uh, we didn't get to see. We're going to play the whole incident for you here on our monitor here. Perhaps you can tell us uh, how you saw it and what the problems were. Okay, roll the tape, Bob. Problem is, obviously, I didn't see you. See, you notice how far the truck was out. I saw this car. This car is the only thing that we could see coming around the corner because it's a blind corner. He had no idea that they would have the big truck out there right in the, in, on the line. So uh, it was just ridiculous. Usually when there's something like that, you can expect a full course yellow. Because if it's a, a local yellow, you still, you know, once you know the way the incident is set up, you know, you pretty much, you know, you calculate that. But uh, this was a surprise the next lap. The, and uh, the car that was there, in my opinion, if they were going to keep a local yell, should have just been pushed back and be done with it, not try to throw it away with a huge truck right on the line there. It's impossible. I was afraid that one of these days, one of those things was going to happen. How bad? I see your car's in line to restart. Uh, what's wrong with it, and what kind of shape will it be when the green comes out again? Well, the, the top is broken up, but uh, structurally it's okay. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, uh, that's evidence that I slowed down quite a bit for the accident but there was uh you know that the truck was just a total surprise just no way i could turn by not knowing that, that that it was there what kind of corrective action will you recommend car take after this incident uh, well if they were going to bring the, the safety truck out there they were going they should go to full course yellow then we're not racing anymore okay thanks very much mario get back to your car appreciate you coming by to give us a word mario andretti uh still at it after many many years uh, and a very obliging guy when it comes to the press. Thanks again, Mario. Back to you, Ken. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, uh, uh, one other thing we need to straighten out there, that Dennis Vitolo, I believe, was still in the 39. We thought he had stepped out of the car and was waving. That was, that was not he. No. That was a member of the safety crew on the side. And of course, that one safety crew guy had to jump uh, to stop being run over by Vitolo's car, which rolled forward after Michael ran into it. Now, this will change our programming some here on CBS this afternoon. We will be going to the NCAA Championship Series with the men's and women's outdoor track and field title up for stake at the University of Oregon in Eugene. But we're going to stay here and finish this event, the Detroit Grand Prix, before we move out and see if the LSU women win that title for the fifth consecutive year. That's coming up later here this afternoon on CBS Sports. Even if we have to stay here all night, we're going to get this Not race quite. done. Not quite. Mike Joy is on his way to find Wally Dolan back, uh, whose role is, is getting these drivers in line, supervising them at the races, holds the driver's meeting, the director of competition for this stuff, and he's so good at it. Uh, Wally was a great racer himself, and we'll see if we can't get a word from him as we watch Danny Sullivan cinching back up and getting ready to go. There's I no doubt that if you're going to have those trucks out there, as Mario said, you should have the full course yellow. And the only other experience I've ever had of this was doing the Bathurst 1000, you know, that very uh, in Australia? big saloon mm -hmm. car race in Australia. And they have the same sort of thing. They have race cars and race trucks out there all at the same time. So what did you run over? I didn't run over anything, but I, I believe one year they had a really pretty yeah. horrific crash. We'll be back and try to get a word with Wally Dollenbach shortly here at Detroit. The 10th annual is going to go down as the most bizarre in the history of the game. Played on this two and a half mile course. Fittipaldi still trying to win his ninth road race. Stay tuned. Wally Dollenbach, former IndyCar racer. His son a successful driver, but here he wears his other hat, that of cart director of competition, and overseeing this whole debacle. What happened out there? Well, what we did, we had a car that uh, became dis disabled on uh, turn four. The uh, corner workers tried to uh, relieve the situation by pushing it. There was a transmission problem with the car. It looked too dangerous for the um, safety uh, guys out there in the corner, so what we did, we dispatched... Uh, safety one to the scene which is normal we did it under a local yellow and uh, safety one responded to the scene and uh, we displayed the red and white flag at the start finish line and we also had the white flags in the appropriate areas to indicate to the drivers that there was an emergency vehicle out there 
The um, safety one truck pulled up in front of the disabled car, was in the process of pulling it out. Mario Andretti obviously came around and didn't see the truck and uh, ran into the back of it. Um, however, there's nothing unusual about the process that we uh, uh, take care of a disabled car. We've done it hundreds of times and uh, all of us realize that there are some turns on these temporary circuits that uh, are extremely uh, tight. Well, I don't think anybody's taking issue that proper procedure was followed. I think it's pretty clear that it was. But the issue of it being at a blind corner where the driver entering that corner really doesn't know where the incident is. Is that his responsibility or Cart's responsibility at, at that stage as he enters that corner? Well, we were told and we uh, confirmed the fact that the uh, corner workers that were initiating the flag direction out there was telling the drivers where to go. There was a path open there. There was a car that did get through. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, we, we just feel that due process was served out there, and it's an unfortunate thing that uh, perhaps some of the drivers went into it a little hotter than normal, but, um, you know, I, in defense of our guys, in defense of the, the corner workers, uh, there was a lane open, and as soon as it was blocked, we went red, of course. But all the flags were appropriately uh, displayed, and uh, the flagmen did their job as to where to direct the cars. And I can't really tell you what else we can do. I mean, these things, you know, after hundreds of times, we just hope it doesn't happen. But once in a while, something like this can and will happen. Thanks, Wally. Thanks for joining us. Ken, I, I would agree with Wally, because right in the rule book of everything from amateur racing right on up to Indy cars, you have a waving yellow flag, and it is the driver's responsibility, A, not to pass, that's true of any yellow, but to use extreme care and caution in entering that area. So the final responsibility does rest with the driver. David, your thoughts? And that's absolutely right. I'm afraid it does. And we saw Emerson Fittipaldi get through, obviously, at a fairly high speed. You could hear him coming up the hill. He was going at a fair lick. And uh, he, of course, had the added disadvantage of the fact that Mario's car was already stuck under the back of the truck, so he had even less room than Mario. We are restarting, getting ready to resume the Detroit Grand Prix. We just heard from the director of the competition and the chief steward, who was a great stock car driver and an Indy car battler back in the days when the 70s had A.J. running at his best and Mario fought with Wally Dolan back at Milwaukee in the 200 and out at Ontario and in those glorious days when they ran the Trenton 200. Wally was victorious there. And you and I, in fact, have reported on Wallace winning at Trenton back in the days when CBS did all those first but races. You weren't here when he won on the old Langhorn track. Let me tell you, that was something. <laughs> all right, let's talk about this race and what we expect to see from lap 48 to 62. It's going to be a street fight, big time, because now it comes down to bunching all these cars together, regrouping the field. There's been approximately a 50-minute delay. They've gathered them all back up. Second time by, they'll turn them loose with Emerson Fittipaldi in first. Michael Andretti was scheduled for second, and as they came out, I didn't know. No, Michael Andretti has already gone back to the garage on his little motorbike, so Michael Andretti seems to be out the running. So that means that Ray Hall pulls up for second, and Lion Dyke for third, Cheever for fourth, Mears for fifth. John Andretti will be in sixth. And it will be Al Unser Jr. in seventh with Mario Andretti in eighth, Scott Goodyear in ninth, Scott Pruitt eleventh, Brayton twelfth, Willie T. Ribs thirteenth, and Danny Sullivan in fourteenth. And I would further point out that Mario Andretti is the last car in the lead lap. The first nine, hypothetically, are contenders to win it here. Mario, of course, don't let us forget, Mario had pulled up from absolutely dead last after that very unfortunate incident he had earlier on when he had a flat tire after a caution period and had pulled up to that uh, eighth spot from, in fact, dead last. And gathering nine cars together on a tight road course like this could lead to another full course caution. We should point that out. 48 laps would be complete, 14 laps and 35 miles to go in the Detroit Grand Prix. Fittipaldi looking to win this again, and that would give Brazil six wins and ten starts. The name I neglected to mention, Nelson Piquet, back in the Formula One days winning here. Then Senna has won it three times. Then Emerson. And Senna, of course, is on the pole here three times. Only missed it just the one year, 1987. And... Um, it's going to be, uh, I, you say that uh, Emerson Fittipaul is going to win this race. Okay. Ari Leyendijk's been running very, very strong all afternoon. And of course, with this caution, or with this red flag, 
and the subsequent stop, he's not far behind him on the road. Because of the unusual circumstances here in Detroit, we'll be joining in progress the NCAA Men's and Women's Track and Field Championships next this afternoon on CBS. They'll be joined in progress at the completion of this Detroit Grand Prix. Vittipaldi, who has won eight times in CART PPG competition on a road course, yet 14 wins back in the Formula One days when he was twice world champion, seems to rise to the occasion when he comes to Detroit likes this course. He likes it where it's difficult. He certainly is a good road race, and I, I'm very impressed, too, the way he's adapted to the ovals. He was running like uh, Jack the Bear this year at Indianapolis, but he had that unfortunate problem with the engine or whatever it was that let him down, and, of course, he won the race just two years ago. What are the pluses? What are the minuses when you have a 50-minute delay like this? Well, there's no doubt about it. The adrenaline does stop flowing. Um, you know, you're pumping up all week for this race. And uh, on a hot day like today, you really get um, a lot of adrenaline flows. You lose a lot of water. You dehydrate tremendously during that race. And then a long period of inactivity like this definitely slows the body down. The muscles start to contract. They start to get themselves ready uh, to live normally. And suddenly, you're going to subject them to another 14 laps of uh, utmost tension. And I never find caution periods of any sort very satisfactory, even when you're still rolling. And a long period like that where you actually stop I find uh, pretty unsettling here you see Fittipaldi and all but for one man he would not be in competition today he started his own Formula One team Copra Sucre and I believe it was an embarrassment to him he was frustrated and Ralph Sanchez down in Miami got him to come out and run the spirit of Miami in the IMSA sports car race several years ago and Anyway, he put on a grand performance and liked it so much. He wanted to come back and give it a shot. There's Roger Penske. The silver fox of IndyCar racing, if ever there was. And of course, we just saw a shot there of Mike Landretti back in his civilian clothes. No doubt a very disappointed and frustrated young man. This isn't going to do his championship hopes much good he was uh, lying third in the championship now that's the corner where the incident just took place they came about and they're running down Woodridge how much speed right in here when you go by the church in race in speed yeah. mm -hmm. they're probably in fifth gear there they up around about 145 mile an hour mark 150 and as you can see it's very narrow there here you see Fittipaldi number five and behind him is the number 15 now that is the lap car of Scott Goodyear in the Lola Judd. Big responsibility for him in these streets. <clears throat> the leaderboard as of 49 laps looked like this. Fittipaldi, Ray Hall, Leyendike, Cheever, Mears to 49. We'll get a green on 48. And looking further back, John Andretti, Hunter Jr., Mario, Scott Goodyear, Scott Brayton rounding out the top 10. And a guy who really is going well, he's in the back there in that bright yellow machine there with the red wings, is of course Willie T. Ribs, who's lying 12th. Number by 10. By far the uh, leading Cosworth contender this afternoon. Maybe his pal Bill Cosby should just buy him a Chevrolet. Be a big help. You're determined to spend I'm Bill and Camille's money, aren't you? I'm determined to spend Bill Cosby's money. I want to see this done <laughs> for all sorts of reasons. Uh, Willie has carried the colors well for Walker and Cosby today. Fittipaldi bringing the field about two laps and then they turn them loose. I think the man to watch will be Lion Dyke in the number nine car, line third. He's bound to give it a run here. He made a great start earlier, fought with Michael over the first 10, 12 laps of the race, made it an exciting program as we began. Cheever, one of his best days was here in that very first Formula One race when John Watson came out from back of the 20th position to win it. And Cheever came home in second. Field bunch last last two corners. Fittipaldi now starting to nail it. He's going to want to get away here. He's going to want uh, Scott Goodyear to act as a bit of a block on Ray Hall and Lion Dyke for him. All being just a bit careful into turn one for the first time on their second start of the day. Scott Fittipaldi Goodyear. getting a great start. Lion Dyke scooting down oh. the inside on Scott Goodyear. Did they clip there? No, I no, don't believe so. Flew up in the air, I thought. And maybe not. Now then, Ray Hall under pressure from Harry Lyondike. 
Then the lap car. Good year. Fourth overall on the field, but running a lap down. Here comes Lyondike, trying to close ground again. Closing in on Bobby Ray Hall for second position. Ray Hall leading the cart PPG standings. Whoa, Emerson Philip Paul, his car loosening up there as he goes between turns 10 and 11. I mean, uh, 8 and 9. Down Lyon and Street, this is the bumpy bit where we saw him make that great pass on Bobby Ray Hall. Bobby Ray Hall blocking any attempt by Ari Lyondike to get past him on that lap. He won't be quite so accommodating now, with just a few laps to go. Big cloud cover, I, I suppose that course has changed some out there. It would have changed a little bit, it was breaking up, we'd had reports of it breaking up before, and uh, it's still got the same rubber down on it. It won't have changed dramatically because the sun has been sort of half shining most of the day, but of course as the day wears on and the sun gets lower, comes off the direct shining on the track, it obviously cools up dramatically. Fittipaldi has leaped out in front, and Bobby Ray, although it's second in Australia, second at Long Beach, second in Phoenix to get the season started, runs second right now here in Detroit. Chris Economaki? Well, when that sun went behind the cloud, these drivers say that these racetracks change instantly when the sun goes. It's a lot cooler now. And there's a cool breeze blowing. So the tractive quality of the asphalt surface here is a lot better than it was when the red flag came out. Looking back from Ray Hall's car number 18 at Lion Dyke. There's that long turn one from inside the car. See how close they get that guardrail on the exit. Up to about 145 down into turn three. Harry Lyondike closes up a bit on the brakes. There you can see all those little bits and patches of concrete up to the corner where the trouble was, turn four. Emerson Fittipaldi stretching the lead just a little bit. Fittipaldi smells blood. He took that start. It was his to start at his discretion, and he really got a magnificent start, pulled about 10 car lengths on Ray Hall as they came to the line and drew away in turns one and two. Here you see Ray Hall in second, Lion Dyke in third. It's so hard on those single file restarts to judge. Somebody wants to go, goodbye. Goodbye, exactly. And of course, if you get bogged down behind somebody who doesn't go, uh, you are absolutely trapped, especially when you've got those two sharp corners coming onto the start finish straight like they have here. Chief is back in fourth spot. We don't even see him at the moment. Ray Hall seems to be able to hold his own very well with Ari Lion Dyke. There you see those marbles rolled up, getting kicked up by the outside tire. Down to the, coming into the tunnel with the cloud cover now, not quite so bad going into that tunnel as it would have been earlier on. There you see the leader, Fittipaldi, 1989 winner, and there you see the interval. Back to second place, Ray Hall, and third place, Lion Dyke. straight up to about 175 just run right about there before they put the brakes on into the corner fourth place coming about Eddie Cheever Eddie Cheever. see Cheever just coming into your picture he is in fourth and following him is Rick Mears in fifth just behind Eddie Cheever now here is Cheever and there you see Rick Muir's after him, and then Al Unser, and Unser is in the sixth position. And right behind Al Unser now is Mario Andretti. <laughs> there you see a good onboard shot from uh, Al Unser. There's uh, Eddie Cheever coming into the Congress Park area under the trees. not making, I don't think, making any ground on Lion Dyke. If it is, it's pretty slow, but sure. The Brazilians have certainly had some fine moments here at Detroit. Senna three times in a row. Earlier, Nelson Piquet. Out of retirement, Emerson Fittipaldi winning here in 89. And right now, it looks like he has the legs to do it again. Ray Hall trying to reel him in. Lion Dyke right there as well. Cheever further back in that fourth position and there you see part of that interval between first and second and third Penske car leading Penske Chevrolet two Lola Chevrolets and another Lola Chevrolet of Eddie Cheever 
Mears and Defensky, of course, in fifth spot. Ooh, good grace there for fifth. That must be Alonso going down the inside of Rick Mears. They come into turn one, side by side, down the long straight. And Alonso's got the corner, but Rick Mears is not giving up. Rick Mears likes the outside, as he proved in Indianapolis this year with that amazing move on Michael Andretti. I'll tell you an interesting thing about Rick Mears in that car. Did you know that a third of that race at Indianapolis, he drove with his left foot over his right foot because it hurt so much he couldn't keep it on the throttle? So 217, 220 mile an hour laps, and he just couldn't keep the foot pressed on the old accelerator, so he had to use his other foot, and that's how he won this year's Indy 500. Of course, that yes. stems from his injuries way back at San Air in uh, Montreal, just outside Montreal, many, many, many years ago. And from the crash that he had in practice uh, this year at Indy as well, and he hadn't quite recovered. He's back at uh, full strength here for Detroit, but those off-road racers, his brother Roger just won in the truck division, the Baja 500, and he was as thrilled about that, or seemed to be, as his own Indianapolis one. Couldn't wait to tell uh, an individual of, of how excited he was that Roger had such a great run in that Nissan truck. Here you see the nine, Lion Dyke closing in again on Ray Hall, gets him down to two car lengths. Cheever just behind him out of the picture, and, and Al Unser closing in on Cheever, but there's no doubt about it, Lion Dyke is closing up on Ray Hall. And look at Fittipaldi pull away. Second and third is at issue, and Unser continuing to pull up, try to get some additional points. They give 20 points for a win in kart racing. Then it goes to 16 for second, 14 for third, 12 for fourth, 10, 8, 6, down to one. And with this positioning today, Ray Hall in second place, if he can do it for the fourth time this year, he'll draw away a bit from some of those who are battling him so tightly for the championship. It's what Emerson Fittipaldi needs in the worst possible way as a win, because he slipped way down to 10th spot in the standing. He's only got 21 points at the moment compared to Bobby Ray Hall's 60. He hasn't had a very lucky season so far, and uh, I must say I hate talking about him winning the race at this stage of the race, because if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, Nigel Mansell started the wave when he thought he was going to win the Grand Prix on the last lap, and the car stopped about five seconds later. So don't let's talk about Emerson Fittipaldi winning this race. A couple of years back, with 13 laps to go, he and Mario tangled down by Cobo Hall, and he still came back to win as he overcame Scott Pruitt, finishing in second position that round. Looks Emerson. pretty good at the moment. The car seems to have got plenty of grips, got good um, traction coming off the corners. He's not doing much fish staining. The whole thing seems to be handling extremely well. He's made a couple of changes to the car during the course of the race, and he was able to work on it during that extended red flag period as well. And he looked incredibly relaxed and happy during that period, uh, unlike you would expect a guy to look who's had the race pretty well. Locking up the left front there. Ooh, now he's Mr. Gear. That will close the others up a lot. Coming to the Atwater Tunnel. See, For just a moment. Talking about it too soon. And here comes Ray Hall charging right back into it. Now then, I wonder if he's got a tire deflating. The sign, uh, uh, a front brake locking up sometimes uh, can signal another tire deflating. The diagonally opposite one on the car. Seven laps to go, seven remaining, and Ray Hall is challenging for the lead. Emerson Fittipaldi wanting this win. Said it would be the perfect day to win on Father's Day and become a father once again. Talking to Roger Penske about that this morning, he says, I think that he's about two days off on that becoming a new father. Of course, Ray Hall also wanting a win. He's leading the championship and, of course, has not won a race this year. And he really feels that he has to win a race to be a worthy leader. Look at Ray Hall close. Here he is coming down Congress, picking up 120 miles, 130 miles an hour here, up to 140, hard on the brakes, brings it back down. Makes that quick turn, gets himself onto Bobien, and now about to head on to Larned, where they'll really pull some power, and if there's anything amiss on car five, Ray Hall can make the move. One of the problems that Philip Bollis had this year is had some gearbox problems, and of course, if you're going to get gearbox problems anywhere, the streets of Detroit are certainly a classic place for it. Coming to Cobo Hall. Not much time to view the spectators here by the Joe Lewis Arena, then down the hill. That's about, what, a 10, 12 degree drop there, David? It's quite a steep drop, and it's breaking up. They go through there in the one gear. Although it may be now that as they get near the race, if they've got enough fuel left, they'll be using 
using some slightly lower gear. Or a shorter. Maybe using second here instead of third to make the most acceleration onto the straight. Ray Hall right with him now. Ray Hall in the draft as they go down the straight. Down to just a couple of car lengths between Fittipaldi and Dublin, Ohio's Bobby Ray Hall. Leading by just two points over Rick Mears coming into this battle. Here we are back in turn one. Ray this Hall is really closing up on the brakes there. Coming through turn two. Ray Hall so smooth, so consistent, and on this track, which is anything but smooth and anything but consistent, it's one of the ultimate tests, and Ray Hall always meets it. Here he is, just dancing this car. Sun's out again. That again will alter the temperature of this racetrack, and change things just a little bit for these drivers. This is live, the Detroit Grand Prix in its final moments, delayed almost an hour after one of the most bizarre situations we've ever seen when the entire Paul Newman, Carl Haas team was in collision at turn three of the course. Dennis Vitolo's car. Whoa, 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 whoa. Nice. Ray Hall locks up the right front there, guy. That's, he was thinking about trying what Emerson Fittipaldi did to him just a few laps back. Well, an hour and a bit back now, but um, decided against it, pulled back and lost a bit of weight on the inside wheel and locked her up. Closes here at that first gear turn. There's one other turn which you could run at first gear, right down at the bottom of the hill as you enter the tunnel. That one's really tricky there. This one could be used, they could sometimes use first here. Well, I think these Chevrolet engine cars are using second there as an emergency gear, and third normally, which uh, they've got a tremendously wide rev band. The struggle for first place with five laps to go. Not the easiest track in the world to pass on there. Is Eddie Chief just coming to picture? Ray Hall right with him. Now, last time he was very late on the brakes into turn one. Going down the outside. Peter Pauly covering the inside. Difficult to make an outside pass there. Certainly not beyond the realm of possibility, but not your first choice. Bobby Ray Hall last win 1989 at the Meadowlands on another of these artificial street circuits seeking his 20th career victory <laughs> and there you see Debbie Bobby Rahal's wife wearing his Rolex for good luck today David now well, she's thinking hard about how much luck she can give him too down the inside once more but you remember how rough it is there? But he pulled, but he pulled, he pulled off that great pass there, all four wheels off the deck. Bobby doesn't seem to be quite of a mind to try the same stunt. Lion Dyke lies third, about 10, 15, 12 car lengths back, something like that. Then comes Eddie Cheever. Al Unser is to fifth. Rick Mears is in sixth. John Andretti is to seventh. Mario is in eighth. They are in the lead lap. One lap down in ninth is Scott Goodyear, followed by Scott Brayton and Scott Pruitt. Danny Sullivan's going 12th, Willie T. Ribs in 13th, a lap down. Then two laps down is Tony Bettenhausen and Masusta. For the lead. Now, this is the place. He's using the draft to the best of his ability. It looks further on here than it is. He's, he's pretty close. Down Four the outside. That's how close. By right, taking that wider entry, he'll probably come off the corner just a bit quicker. Maybe he's got thoughts of overtaking him into this corner, but it's a tricky one to do it. It's very narrow and a very unyielding uh, apex and exit. An avid golfer, this guy in car number 18, Bobby Rahal, needs a birdie right here, real bad comes down Congress and tries to close in and leaving him for the moment is Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi seems to be just a little bit quicker on those sweepers. And you have just a tap on. Tap marker, good uh, play of things of course, the fly of the land. Fittipaldi starts dancing around on the brakes there. Very bumpy on that line of street into turn 10. This back marker, the very oh no, managed to get round him. Ooh, and Ray Hall squeezed over there. That's Buddy Lazier in the 90 car. 
Bobby Ray Hall was the runner-up here a year ago. He's had three second-place finishes in the first three races of 1991. He'd certainly like to change that situation, and here he is making another challenge as they go through the tunnel. Harry Leindyke falling back a little bit, and not too far behind him is Eddie Cheever. There's four laps left. Three just about to be cut. There's that uh, far out of control and out of the inside. And I think that was uh, Chiva. Chiva trying to get around Buddy Lazier, who slowed right up, I think. Oh, Chiva locks everything up going into turn one. That's Al Jr. just coming around turn one and two right behind him. So the pressure's not off Chiva yet. Chiva running in fourth and Al Jr. closing in fifth. Meanwhile, two and a half mile course here in Detroit as he makes his charge. Time is running out. Wants this win. He has the lead in the standings. He could really stand a win on the podium and he has closed it up each time on these straightaways. Emerson Fittipaldi, the twice world champion, draws away a bit. But in the tighter part of the course, Ray Hall counters and closes ground. Even if he finishes second, he will extend his lead quite considerably because of the nearest pursuers, which are Rick Mears and Michael Andretti. Obviously, Michael Andretti is right out of the hunt. Mears, Mears is back, back in, in six. six. The pump house turn. The straightaway which heretofore has been owned by Fittipaldi. I believe we're showing two on the field. Two on the field this time by, and into one. And right here, it's negative camber, David. It throws right, you down. Exactly, just right there, it wheels away. The floor peels away and leaves you right out to that guardrail on the exit. It's like one of those wild rides at the country fairs at the end of the summertime. Just throws your stomach no matter how used you are to things, every driver will tell you, that one will get your attention. It looks to me like Ray Hall may have settled for second, unless he's lulling Emerson into a false sense of security with just one lap to go. Scott Pruitt in trouble. The car number 11, which had been running in 11, retires. Fittipaldi stays first, Ray Hall second, Leyendijk third. In fourth, Cheever, Unser fifth, Rick Muir sixth, John Andretti in seventh, Mario back in eighth, eight cars in the lead lap have the most lead changes in a CART PPG race in the three-year history. They've run this course here in Detroit. And unusual circumstance taking us well past the time that we thought we would be with you. A 50-minute hold after the Andretti's both crashed on the back of a safety truck at turn three. That one is going to be conjecture for some time. That'll keep the score. Oh, Emerson going. locking up that right front again. That'll put him off his stroke as he goes into the tunnel. This is an important part here. Ray Holt to pull up to him under the tunnel. That's that first. Maybe his front tire's going off just a little bit. Watching for the Paul to get that turn just before you come to the tunnel. It's a first gear turn. You want to run it that way. Some take it in second. White flag is out. One lap to go. If Bobby Ray Hall has anything else to deliver, now is the time to send it special delivery. Here he is in turns one and two, and he's closer this time. He's moved in just that much more, but on this straightaway, look at Fittipaldi leap away. Up to turn three. And out of the turn where they've had trouble before, had that big hesitation in the race, St. Antoine and Woodbridge. Now up onto the Chrysler Freeway, down to Congress for the final time. Emerson Fittipaldi still in front and draws away. Coming up to that hard 90 degree left hand turn onto Mobian. Headed for Larned. Fittipaldi trying to win it again. <laughs> this track sure likes Brazilian drivers. Well, it would seem. <laughs> but remember, he's had trouble just at that tunnel entrance twice, David. And Ray Hall. He's only going to do it one more time down to Cobo Hall. This is the slowest corner here. If he's going to have a braking problem, it could occur there, but he seems to traverse that. Oh, Jeff Andretti in front in the 786 car. Yellow flag is out. 
Final time through. Ooh, he's going to have to pass Andretti in the tunnel. Or maybe just on the other side by the pump house. Here they come out. It's clear. It's a run to the finish now. Closing in. Ray Hall. Look how he cuts it down into that final straightaway now. From Sao Paulo, Brazil and Miami, Florida. Fighting to the finish. Checkered flag about to be unfurled. And at the line. 44-year-old Emerson Fittipaldi has just won his 13th CART PPG race. One more, and that would tie his mark with his Formula One victories. A great victory for Emerson Fittipaldi here today in the Detroit Grand Prix. The Penske Chevy has done it. And Emerson Fittipaldi, the man of the hour. And we have another winner this year. That's the sixth different winner on the CART PPG circuit for 1991. Fittipaldi, for the second time in his career, wins at Detroit. Bobby Rahal finishes in second. And the Dutchman, Ari Leyendijk, pulling up in number nine to congratulate him. Al Unser, Jr., comes home in fourth. Mears will be fifth. And Cheever dropped way back at the end. Six went to John Andretti, then Mario Andretti. There's Roger Penske talking with some of his crew after this brilliant victory by Emerson Fittipaldi. Eddie Cheever concluding the day in eighth position. Eddie Cheever stopped down at turn nine for some reason, although we don't know why yet. But he had that violent uh, maneuver down at the end there. Maybe something like a drive shaft broke. So the winner today is Emerson Fittipaldi. The Penske Chevy has done it again, and the great Brazilian champion reigns supreme over the mean streets of Detroit. Aldi has won the Valvoline Detroit Grand Prix, and he won it by only two-tenths of a second, almost three, 0.29, the margin of victory by which Emerson defeated Bobby Ray Hall at the line here today. The completion of 155 miles, 62 laps. And a jubilant Fittipaldi now being taken out of car number five. Off comes the five-point hitch. Harness is off. Radio has been disconnected, and Emerson clambers out of this $400,000 car, this $4 million team put together for him by Roger Penske has tasted success here in Detroit. Fittipaldi, another guy that uh, yeah, yeah. in the thick of uh, political uh, maneuverings at the moment, uh, all sorts of uh, contracts are going between Penske and Marlborough and Fittipaldi, etc., etc. So that win was something I guess that Fittipaldi really felt he had to achieve uh, sometime during the season, and I guess today was as good a day as any. Certainly was, and it was as dramatic as anything we've ever seen on the IndyCar series with this delay, with this bizarre situation on one of the corners holding us up for nearly an hour. Chris Economaki is standing down there in the victory area, and I believe with the man who's just done it. Christopher? I didn't know you were a drinking man, Emma. How, how thirsty are you? Well, it was, a, was a very tough race the last few laps. Uh, when it was like seven laps to go, I had a good lead on Bob and he started jump out of the gears. I have to drive with just my left arm, and I was holding the gear, gear lever with my right arm. How, how much time did you spend looking in the mirror in those closing laps? Well, I was not looking in the mirror, I was looking at my gearbox, because I was jumping out of gears, and I was trying to hold as quick as I could uh, Bobby, but on the very slow corners with one hand, it was very tough and very difficult to be quick. I was quite quick on the fast corner. The car worked beautifully. What did they do to the car, M.O., during the uh, red flag period? Did they work on it? No, no, the car, I mean, before I did 43-1, I was faster mid-race when I was leading before. We didn't change the car, just new tires. The car was beautiful the whole race. Now, what about uh, over there where the, where the corner was blocked? You were the only one to get through. How close a call was that for you? Well, when I saw the marshals giving the sign, they were really, really looking like emerging, something bad. And I went very slow, and I was able to go through on the inside. Well, you did a great. Happy Father's Day, Amo. Thank you very much. Great. Oh, Thank oh, you. Good enough. Well, let's go back now to Ken Squire. It was a grand victory for Fittipaldi and for Roger Penske, who has just scored his 66 as a car owner. And look again, David Hobbs, at this wonderful moment in racing when Fittipaldi made this move on Bobby Rahal. Goes to the outside. The rail goes to block it. All four wheels off the ground comes alongside. And at this stage, Rahal knows he's done. 
No point turning into the side of Fittipaldi. A bold move by Fittipaldi and a difficult one. Not a trace of tire smoke. And well executed by both drivers throughout the race. This 62 lap, 155 mile test. Here's Mike Joy. I'm with Ari Leyendijk, who's going to be on the winner's rostrum. And she's another great top three finish for you. And tell me now, how mean are the mean streets of Detroit? Well, they're still pretty mean. As you can see, I don't look that healthy anymore after uh, a two-hour race. But uh, my car is working really good. And at the end of the race, uh, I couldn't really challenge Bobby because um, we had a boost problem. I think we picked it up when we were uh, stopped there with the red flag situation. There, uh, I had the engine running, and the engine got very hot. And uh, I think it kind of hurt the engine. We didn't have much power at the end. But you had a great run today. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I mean, uh, you know, I've uh, never had as good a race as I had here thanks to uh, my crew and my engineer, Morris Nunn, and the whole crew. They just did a fantastic job, and uh, it makes all the difference. Congratulations. Thank you. The 1990 Wittipaldi has won. Around the Renaissance Center, they race today in the Detroit Grand Prix, and the man who came home second is standing by with Mike Joy. With Chris Economaki. Congratulations on that great second place finish, Bobby. It was an exciting finish. He had too much for you? Uh, down the straights, he was just a little too strong. And uh, when I could get a run at him in one, he, uh, that Penske got pretty wide. <laughs> but uh, it was just a, uh, we gave it everything we had, and he did too. We were both locking tires up. Are you, you, know? I, are you telling me that he, he uh, used all the road, Bobby? No, there was a little bit left for me. <laughs> but not, <laughs> not enough, enough, huh? But <laughs> what, what, what about the handling of the car? You, you really were giving it your all. I'm sure we could see wheels locking up here and then slithering and sliding. Did you have anything left at all? Uh, no, I mean, uh, the last 10 laps, uh, I actually made a little bit of a mistake. I got a little wide and I lost to Emerson and Ari caught up and I said, come on, let's get it together. So we drove pretty hard. In fact, I think we went quicker than I qualified. So uh, in the last lap, so uh, we were we weren't holding anything back. Let's put it that way. Let's look back at that incident over there that brought the race to a halt. You were involved in that. What I mean, you had to stop over there. How did you see it? Well, I mean, the lap before they were pushing the fellow and uh, there was room to get by and and uh, but when I came back around, uh, the, the guys were waving the yellow flags very hard, so I really didn't see it. I mean, when I got around the corner, you could see Michael's car sitting there, and only until I got right up there could I see what really happened. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate uh, that, it, that they both had the incident and that it stopped the race because uh, there was some gambling going on by people with pit stops. And it would have been interesting how it panned out, but uh, the SCP Craco car ran beautifully, and, uh, you know, I'm, real, I'm, I'm disappointed we didn't win, but I'm pretty pleased about second. Bobby, a year ago today, your hands were ribbons. Let's yeah. see them today. They're pretty good. Oh, you're telling us it was an easy race, huh? Well, I won't say it was easy, but easier. Happy Friday. Hey, Debbie, come over here. It's pretty wife here. What were you thinking of those closing laps, Debbie? Well, very anxious. It was almost the way I felt at Indy when, you know, you want them to go so well. And these second places are wonderful. And we're real happy for the team, but I think we need a first somewhere along the line here. Okay, now it's Father's Day. Where are your kids? They're home in, uh, in Columbus. Hi, Michaela, Graham, Jared. How you doing? See you okay. soon. Okay. A happy second place finisher, Bobby Ray Hall and his wife, Debbie. Now let's go to Mike Joy with Alan Sir Jr. Well, Al Salvage is a fourth place finish in what, geez, has really been a strange day for you, for everybody here. Yeah, it really has. Um, the Valvoline crew did a great job. The Valvoline car ran great. And, um, you know, we were just, we made a wrong decision on our on our first pit stop. And uh, and I came back out in the back of everybody. And, uh, and then I worked my way back up to the front. And uh, on my second stop, we didn't get all the fuel in it. So I had to come back in on and make three stops and that, that ruined it for the day. And, and that put me behind everybody again. And I was thankful for the red flag because that at least packed us up to where I could at least gain, gain three spots, which I did at the end. But, um, you know, it was a great day here in, here in Detroit and uh, I finally finished. So yeah. I'm happy about that. Well, this track takes a lot of wraps for it being very tight, blind corners, very bumpy, and, and very physically demanding and mentally demanding. But uh, you got a good finish here today. And uh, has your opinion of this place changed maybe a little? No, not really. It's still very tight, and it's still a lot of work. And, uh, and it is bumpy. But uh, you know, my opinion about the place has changed in the aspect that we can do good here. We can finish. We can get past halfway point. And uh, for the Valvoline folks, that's, uh, that's encouragement. Okay, and but for that fuel nozzle, he'd likely be on the rostrum right now. Let's go back to Ken Squire. 
a track that has not been good to him. He finishes fourth on today. A look at the final standings here with Fittipaldi second and with that move by Bobby Rahal to second place uh, puts him well up in the points by some 81 he now leads in the CART PPG standings. Rick Mears got himself fifth today looking further back on the standings board. John Andretti came home six. Mario in seventh. Danny Sullivan was tenth and just back of them Willie T. Ribs had himself an 11th place finish with Eddie Cheever winding up finally in 12th place as things really went amiss for him in those final two or three laps. Tony Bettenhausen for 13, and here are some of the cars that retired, as you see. Michael uh, Andretti is credited with 19, Dennis Vitolo with 20. We'll get back to that story in a moment. Guido Daco was out early. There's the rest of the field, and here's Chris Economaki with Roger Penske. Uh, Roger Penske is with me here, the owner of the winning car and the car driven by Rick Mears. Congratulations, Roger. Emma really gave us a race, a fine show at the closing limits. What did you do to the car during the uh, yellow flag, a red flag period? Well, Chris, the only thing we really did, we changed tires uh, on Emerson's car. On Rick's car, we changed tires and bled the brakes because basically the setups were good all weekend and the drivers didn't want to change anything other than the tires. You got yourself a real racer in M.O. Fittipaldi. What about the national championship down the road? You guys going after that? Well, of course, uh, that's that's the name of the game while we're out running. I think that, uh, you know, Rick is a consistent finisher. He gave can finish here today, but Ammo needed a win, and I think this is really going to set him going here for the rest of the season. Okay, how, how's, how's Rick feeling? He's feeling fine, basically. You know, his foot is still a little bit sore, and on this type of a track, it's a tremendous, takes a tremendous amount of pressure to, to stop the car, but he's in great shape. Well, thanks again, Roger. Let's go to Mike Joy. Well, John Andretti was the only of the clan not to suffer misfortune. It looks like it took a lot out of you to get through Detroit today. Well, we were um, misfortunate that we didn't quite hit the setup exactly as we hoped, but it's about the hardest race I think I ever had in my life, and I don't want to have another one like that. I'd rather, it's a lot easier when you run up front. John Andretti with a sixth place finish today. Ken? And that puts him fourth in the standings. More from Detroit coming up shortly here where Emerson Fittipaldi and the Brazilian flag fly high. It's the end of a most unusual day. So for Chris Economaki, David Hobbs, and Mike Joy, I'm Ken Squire saying so long from Detroit, Michigan. Join us next...